Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the Royal Rumble edition of the Jim Cornette Experience. Vince McMahon is gone again. Slim Jim left and came back, and the Royal Rumble was the latest big event overshadowed by chaos in the mainstream news. And joining me to talk about all this and so much more, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you. He was going to be number 31 in the Rumble, but the airline lost his bag. The great Brian Last, everybody. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again. And uh, I did not enjoy the Rumble as much as I did last year's Rumble. I'll just say that to start. Well, don't give anything away. <laughs> but I, I think it's kind of, it might be self-evident. There were moments. There were moments, and then there was a lot of other moments. But we'll talk about that. But uh, do you remember? When back in the old days, Brian, when promoters tried to sabotage other companies' pay per views and not their own, I do. Is this two in a row now that something bizarre comes out uh, right before a company's pay per view that's of of their own making, or technically, in this case, of the previous administration's own making? And the big event, it's kind of like after it's over, you're like, oh, I wish I liked that a lot more to make up for the other shit. And it was like, eh. But anyway, before we get into this story with Mr. McMahon, who has now been replaced, uh, or replaced Satan on the fucking all-time hit list of people who want to burn him in hot fucking boiling oil, and well-deserved, allegedly. What, do we have to say allegedly at this point? I guess well, it still hadn't been adjudicated. Jerry McDivitt's still on the payroll. We have to say allegedly. Still. No. I, I, Jerry McDivitt, unless he's discovered the fountain of youth, he's not going to live long enough to get Vince McMahon out of any of this shit. And I'm I'm betting you he's got his telephone disconnected. He's, he's clipped the fucking cord. But uh, it, at any rate, whether it's alleged or not, Vince has so much heat. You and I got some of his fucking heat. And I will tell the people what happened because the other day we had just finished. We were still on headset with each other talking, had finished recording one of the 18 shows we do every week. When suddenly the Wall Street Journal headline popped up on your computer and we were still going and we said, we'll do a breaking news for the YouTube people. What the fuck's going on here? Vince is getting sued again. <clears throat> and as we read this, I, you know, I don't know what to say to you folks otherwise than, God damn it, if you can read in the Wall Street Journal that an internationally famous billionaire that you once worked for is being hauled into court and sued for, among other things, shitting on somebody's head, you're going to fucking laugh. And potentially at that point, the whole thing becomes a fucking rib. So I apologize for my first blush, but here's another thing. As we've come to find out more details, because a lot of people, by the time that they listen to this thing, the, the, the comments on either Twitter or the YouTube channel, there's some fucking people, again, on this issue that are just goddamn eh, it, it, with a lack of taste on 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 a, a variety of points that were blaming this girl, this young lady, because I, I think that's in addition to the people that were hot at us, we're saying we're the worst human beings in the world because we were laughing at and making mockery of this thing after they'd read the complaint because now the complaint is out in public. But there's also people that, unfortunately, they see this shit on television and they figure, well, this is another one of the cases of the Hollywood producer getting his girlfriend a part in a fucking movie or, you know, fucking pushing her to goddamn the, the moon on the stage or whatever the fuck or some kind of business arrangement gone wrong. And most normal people, that live, hey, even you and me that are not normal, but live somewhat rational fucking lives and don't deal with tens and hundreds of millions of dollars. And they see shit on TV about 
NDAs and hush money payoffs and millions of dollar payments going on and fucking BMWs being bandied about and they think, well, everybody's full of shit. Fuck all these people. And because of what happened last year, Vince was outed with the hush money payments and all that shit, or now the year before, I guess. People never could figure, we, we made jokes about the illegal paralegal. And somebody, you know, it, it, we everybody assumed that, well, Vince gets girlfriends, and he's got them on the side, and then he gives them jobs and pays him a bunch of money and whatever the fuck, and, and he was paying his girlfriends with company money. Well, they're all a bunch of heels. But when you read the the actual, and how do you get, can, is this public, the complaint, the lawsuit, whatever the terminology is. is, can you, okay, then everybody ought to go read this. This wasn't a case of Vince went to fucking, you know, St. Petersburg and found some stripper at a goddamn Hooters or whatever and gave her a job in the legal department. This girl, and, and remember, <clears throat> when you asked me on the clip, because I'd seen a black and white picture, and I said, what, can she be 30? And I was kind of giving it the benefit of the doubt to the elder side because he fucking 75. And it, But then... <laughs> You said, well, I don't know, she looks younger than that. I saw the color picture. I said, you're right. We think she was 21. We've got to verify that because there's been some kind of other reports. You thought she was in her early 40s. And the, that news, can't the newspaper be the said, flat out, I saw, I think, yeah. in the New York Post and somewhere else that she was 43 and that she was 41 a couple of years ago when all this happened. Well, bullshit. So the the, the point is, She's a very young girl that's never had a job or worked out in the real world because she's been taking care of her ailing parents that have passed away. They've lost a family home in bankruptcy. This is like goddamn Dorothy in Kansas. It's a tragedy. And because she lives in this building where she knows the building manager, the building manager says, well, you ought to meet Vince McMahon. He's a billionaire. Maybe he could help you give you a job in his company because she doesn't know what to do. So that's where she's not experienced in any of these things and suddenly gets in with this master fucking manipulator. And we've talked about, you know, Vince's Jedi mind tricks with, with wrestlers on getting them to do finishes or talking them out of shit. But when you read this, this lawsuit... It's in, it's like a horror movie. It's insane the way it's that mind he, games. It was him playing mind no, games. No, that right? that that trivializes it. This but no, but that's how it started. Kind of goddamn! Just, I can't believe he was he was he had to be writing shit down to do to this to prey on her mind like this. This wasn't any kind of frivolous. I'm sorry again. Any kind of frivolous arrangement with some Hooters girl. This was this. Poor girl is obviously disturbed mentally about numerous things, and here comes this billionaire handing her all this shit and say telling what, her she's going to be a vice president? I wouldn't even say disturbed mentally. It's a girl, and we don't know exactly well, how old because of the conflicting things. Who's going through wouldn't it, a ton wouldn't of it shit. disturb you if your parents had died and they it, were bankrupt? But it signifies something house. else when you phrase it like that. You well, can't say I'm she's disturbed mentally. Upset. She but, says someone who's yeah. obviously going through an incredible ordeal emotionally. And it appears based on what you read in the complaint. And again, like you have talked about, it's out there public. Anyone could see it. She goes into detail about their first meeting. It was like a two hour meeting in his apartment, his penthouse. And it was all him trying to relate to her, all him trying to relate her hardships to everything he experienced growing up. And that's how it started. And this it, it it number one I talked about, uh, you know, in uh, previous episodes, plenty of time. How I the the times that I was around Vince McMahon, his contact with anybody <laughs> with anybody was so limited. Besides the, the limo to the fucking show to the office to the fucking, it, it boggles my mind. What has happened to it? Is it is it a combination of uh, late stage, I guess. I don't know if late stage were late age concussions. He started getting concussions after the age of 50 and all the fucking, 
the human growth hormone and testosterone or whatever the fuck he's done. And it, 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 he's, or you were around it, him during the one brief period of time where he acted like an adult in between the steroid trial and all the scandals of the early nineties and the attitude era when he was the most behaved, <sighs> where he seemed at the time he got off steroids and he just seemed like a skinny guy who was in shape. He seemed like he was growing up and then they threw a billion dollars at him. And a publicly traded stock. Well, no, no, no. First, he got in the ring. First, he got in the ring, and, th and then the fucking body went out of control, and then he got a billion dollars. But, but, but he was on steroids in the 80s and 90s. He got off him for a few years. Again, he was, had scandals everywhere. It was the sex scandal. Uh, it was the steroid trial. And then we don't know if this is something that's been in his behavior going how far back. Like, we just don't know. This is... One story we're hearing about, you have to wonder if this is really the first time he's done any of these things or something that he's become accustomed to. We really don't know. But I won't, I don't think it's fair to assume yeah. that this is just something he started doing in his 70s out of boredom or anything. Well, and how, how could you start doing this in your fucking 70s? I mean, it's just and that, and that's the, with Vince. During the time that I was there, being in a room with him was like being in a fucking room with the principal. You know, I can't fathom this this behavior and from that and from the people around him. But if, if dealing chronologically, chronologically with this thing, he put time and effort into this plot against this girl constantly meeting her, constantly giving her gifts, giving her, letting her go to WrestleMania, her and her building manager, uh, promising her these jobs, and then set it up and then put her in these places where not only did she not have everything to do and she didn't know what she was supposed to be doing for all this money, but apparently most of the people that she was working under knew that she was there not to do anything. And they didn't say anything. And then when finally he coerces her at it again, we're not going to go blow by blow on this now with this ridiculous shit. Uh, but, it, it, I mean, I can't imagine being in the building 25 years ago when I was in that office and uh, shit going on any remotely resembling this and people not obviously knowing about it and how they were able to keep it under fucking cover indicates that a number of people apparently just didn't give a shit. Makes it clear from reading the complaint, although there are a number of parties unnamed, and we can discuss that in a little while, that company-wide or executive-wide, there was a long-time knowledge of Vince's behavior, an attempt to kind of brush it aside or ignore it, and maybe even protect him. Protect the company by protecting him, too. But it doesn't appear mm. like... I'm not saying these executives knew some of the gory details, but they certainly knew something yeah. was happening with someone who was not qualified to be there, who had a job, and it appears from the complaint, everyone knew why she was there. That's the other thing. Like, from the complaint from, like, day one, people knew she wasn't... I hate to... You know, I don't know what to call it, a proper hire. Someone yeah. who had the qualifications for the job. She was Vince's person put there to pacify Vince. Everyone knew that from day one. That's a systematic I, problem. Here's the thing. I don't see how, and I agree with you, probably most people did not know particular details, which uh, besides the fact that maybe something might have been done beforehand, also nobody would have been able to keep quiet. There were still enough people named in this that were involved and knew the details because they were there in the room that you would, th how the fuck? This is another thing. Vince, his brain has melted along with his face now. We've laughed about it because he looks like fucking Ernie Kovacs in a fucking 50s TV sketch. But he would have never been this stupid or this childish or this, I didn't even ever see evil. You know, I saw, you know, the guy, I'm going to put this, you know, guy out of business or that or whatever, but not, you know, his brain has evil. fucking melted. Yeah. And, 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 but here's what I was going to say. 
the, she has so much proof in the, or at least evidence. Everybody has to call it evidence, even if you don't call it proof. If you, the, the text messages, if you faked text messages from a goddamn billionaire with all of this kind of publicity, I'm sure you could find a fucking expert to disprove them and they fucking put them out there. Hey, can I stop you talking about the text messages? Yes. There's a few things I want to ask you about those. Please don't read any of them. They'll kick us off of yeah, fucking whatever no. we're on. And again, we hadn't seen all of that when we uh, discussed this previously. And it's incredible to see these, that Vince McMahon is actually sending these horrific text messages out there. Gross, horrific, whatever you want to call them. They, uh, there's a range of them. The first question is, does he have spelling? Like when you used to get memos from him or anything, oh. or anything he wrote, what did you get from him ever that he wrote? And does he have spelling issues? Because there are, Several words or, you know, he, he writes like prints, like there are letters no, instead of it, words. Well, he's trying to do, I think he's trying to do the, the thing the kids do where the word you is instead the capital letter U and then you are is your, and I think he's got some kind of shorthand he thinks making him, him look hip. Here's the thing. When I left, that was just at the era when they were getting the what? What were the blackberries? Was that what it was? Yeah. The black and everybody, because as soon as Jim Ross would come to OVW or Bruce or anybody would come down from the office to OVW, they'd have these things and you could. I said, what the fuck? Vince wanted to be able to keep in contact with everybody always. And we were fortunate. It was basically a phone in your house in, in back in my day in the office. And right as I left, all this shit happened. So I would never got a text from him or texted as everybody knows or blah, blah, blah. But I started thinking about this, how you're, how you're a billionaire like this, a multi billionaire international figure. And it's the same thing as you're the president and you're sending shit like this out to somebody does not show the, at least the prudent judgment of the, potentially sane Vince McMahon I once knew, but I started thinking, you know me, Brian, I'm an obsessive saver and I save things and paperwork and file shit. I do not have one example of Vince McMahon's handwriting because we would be the, it, he insisted everybody, if, if Jim Ross is in the room, Bruce Pritchard, shit stain, anybody, We've all got the same kind of ledger book that we're all booking out of. We've all got the same house show cards that we're working off of that Jim Ross has booked or whatever. We're all writing our own notes as we're talking about it. And I would see Vince writing his book and make notations on his cards or whatever. But Vince would, he would call up and he would dictate shit or he'd tell people, hey, do so and so. Or let so and so make the changes to the cards or disseminate this information. Or you would get memos from the office that he didn't actually write, but that he dictated. But he, and from 96 to 99, and he had a computer in his office, but we didn't have a fucking computer on the, on the desk or the, the table in the dining room that we booked TV off of. Nobody had a computer in that fucking room. He didn't type, at least that I've ever saw at that point. So, you know, that's the thing. He's, he's like Trump. He didn't put shit on paper. He's like Trump in more ways than we found out. So that's, I mean, I've gotten many notes from Bruce or JR would have Xerox copies of the cards that he had written out by hand. I could fucking forge Jim Ross's handwriting at this point. But you got nothing that Vince actually sat down and wrote himself, at least in those days. And but when when you see the the text, it's it's a seventeen year old disturbed boy just having diarrhea of the keyboard typing to some fantasy fucking girl with one hand and the other hands in his lap. And it's embarrassing for a fucking again. It's like I've I've known a guy I thought it was Professor Albert Einstein. It turns out he's he's fucking 
Goddamn fucking Jeremy, goddamn whatever the fuck, that porn star. I've lost his name now. Ron Jeremy. Ron Jeremy. They're Jeremy Ron. Let's just be happy Vince put it all in writing because this is only what's in the complaint. That doesn't mean this is anywhere close to everything. Oh, no, it, That's only know, what's in the complaint. And you know what else? What I was going to say In three years, how many texts did he send her when there's five of these in the fucking 70 pages of this thing? It has to be thousands. And who else did he text? There were other people who got million dollar payoffs that for one reason or another, what were they getting? And here's the other thing. When was this? August is when he was hit with a grand jury subpoena and a search warrant. Did they grab his electronics? Because I don't know. I wasn't there. Because there's a big thing. If they got his phone or his computer, because if we're reading what he's sending her, which is disgusting, and he's sending this to her thinking that she's on his side, that she's going to do it. What was he sending to Laurenitis? What was he sending to the physical therapist that he was doing stuff with? Uh, well, yeah, and if you haven't read this, folks, the Laurenitis was involved in some of it. There's a, a quote-unquote physical therapist that was involved in the head defecation that apparent, and he's... Vince not only starts a physical relationship with this young lady, but then he gets Laurenitis in on it. Then he gets this other guy in on it. Then he starts having her take and send pictures and videos to other people. And that now she's worried about that because they've got blackmail on her because they've got all this fucking porn of her. And he says he's showing it to everyone. He says, I'm showing it to people and they all want to sleep with you. Yeah, but he, and and here's the thing. This again, I'm not absolving Vince McMahon of anything. I'm actually this is more indicting than than the way some people are taking it. There's a, this longest. I didn't know you could text this long. It's just paragraphs and paragraphs with no indentations of how he was showing her pictures to a bunch of quote a bunch of guys on the tech crew. Uh, there were, I paused to count out loud how many guys there were, 12. And all the, it's like the unnatural, stilted dialogue that he would give the fucking talent on television in that he's telling her that all of these guys want to do this and that and the other thing. And they're cheering loudly the thought of doing these things. He's at a TV taping and he's at... He's saying this like it's it didn't really happen is what I'm saying. Of all these other things, yes, but this didn't really happen. He's like a 17-year-old fucking pervert, teenage kid, blurting this shit out like a penthouse forum letter as a 75-year-old supposed adult billionaire to this girl who's got to be thinking, what the fuck is going on here? Well, she's stuck because, again, she has no job. <laughs> She has uh, no home. She has an apartment she's living in and what I'm uh, uh, going to assume is a expensive building to live in. It's a truck it's a, building. It's a high-priced neighborhood. Yeah. Yes. So it's an expensive place to live. Vince buddies up to her. I'm going to get you a job. I'm going to pay all this money. It quickly becomes apparent that the job is in exchange for him just wanting sex all the time or eventually, and this is where the sex trafficking starts to come in, ordering her to have sex with other people. Setting a schedule. This guy wants Tuesdays. This guy wants Mondays. He's acting like a pimp. And uh, it's he, insane. He, it's insane. Like all the dirty shit we knew about Vince. Who no, knew it was never this knew crazy? It. No, the, this yeah, is this crazy. That's, again, that's why it's in a business that has been based on preposterous stories that were uh, uh, surrounding ridiculous personalities for a hundred and something years this is the fucking most outrageous ever one would think and but again she's got documentation on when when she when they did the nda one of the he told her ask the doctor that i sent you to for still for unnamed purposes i don't know what the fuck was going on ask the celebrity doctor for an attorney referral so he's telling her to ask the doctor that he set her up with or has been sending her to to find an attorney to do the NDA. What did you take celebrity doctor as? That the doctor is a celebrity or that it's a doctor for celebrities? 
Well, it just, it's capital C, capital D, celebrity doctor. Um, Because it's Greenwich. I mean, there's a lot of famous people and... You know, around Greenwich. That's why. I well, I, maybe it's a doctor that celebrities go to. I don't know, but and but I mean, they've got documentation just right here without even having a, a adding machine. He gave her like two hundred fifty thousand. How much is a BMW these days? It depends on the model. Well, he gave her like two hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of shit and diamonds and but twenty thousand dollars to medical expenses, whatever. But. It's, uh, he's just, then that's when they started just bringing her to the office and locking her in an office somewhere. And how the how the fuck do you get away with that? I mean, what she describes in the complaint. I was I I felt self conscious when I brought a bag of McDonald's in and closed the door when I ate in my office. I mean, she described that, she described the rape room. She described the fact that she was saying no, please stop, and either Laura Nitus or Vince was saying no means yes. Well, business was happening. There was a rape room that they were using while business. And then they, I guess, leave the room and just go do whatever and come back. That's insane. How does, I mean, we could talk more about Vincent. We're going to John Laurinaitis. I mean, the fact this was happening when his wife was undergoing cancer treatment. The fact that when his wife moved to Connecticut, it didn't stop. It continued. But now it had to be in the office. How does that, the, how, does how this, do you bring that up in the fucking conversation? Johnny, enough about the finishes for the pay-per-view. What? I, I, well, let me ask you this, and we'll get back to it. And again, just to reiterate to everyone, they should read this complaint. The video that we put up was our live reaction in real time. To people the yelled at me and Brian because we were laughing because of the preposterosity of it. But with more details, no, it is not what, again, most people have thought that one of these situations would be. This is, and again, the the time and effort that Vince McMahon, a 75-year-old billionaire, put into doing this. And how can he physically, it's got to be drugs, doesn't it? Artificial hormone at almost 80 years old. How could he be physically up to, I'm not talking about the just the actual, well, I am talking about that, but also just the goddamn, he was still running a fucking billion dollar company and he's putting this much time into this and effort into this. And again, who, who, who are these other depraved individuals? This isn't just let's have an affair. This is depraved fucking shit. Who's this physical therapist that went along with all this? Yes. And Laurinaitis, again, this isn't just he was cheating on well, his now, wife. Would, would, I hate to say anything, but I know Vince has a personal trainer. Would personal trainer be physical therapist? Or we probably don't want to... We don't know anything make about any that, accusations so let's not assume. Yeah, let's not assume there, but... When you assume... Well, here's another thing that comes up in this... But complaint. how, yeah, how do this many people find each other in the same fucking place? It... it <sighs> Yeah, and again, it makes you wonder a lot about things in the past. Things that inexplicably got on TV. I was thinking about something, and it's the stupidest example, but I think it was when Kurt Angle was feuding with Booker T, and he was supposed to be interested in Charmel. I think that's what it was. And they gave him a line to say on TV that he's into bestiality. Like, there's just weird things that got on <laughs> WWE TV over the years. You knew that Wait. Vince had a childish sense of humor. Turns out... It may have been beyond just thinking things that are stupid or funny. He had a completely perverted sense of humor. And perverted may not even be strong enough. Just, I mean, this is deviant shit he's into. I think the... How the many other people did he do this to? The pooping aside, it seems, and to be honest, it, 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 doesn't he go against stereotype like isn't people in high positions of power usually want to be submissive in their personal life whereas he's been about as big of the boss as you could possibly be for the past 40 years and this whole thing is about controlling about every everybody yeah. power and telling people what to do and telling forcing your will upon someone because Vince doesn't do good unless he's that guy in the room. 
Well, that's uh, but he that's can never be submissive. He, he would he never allow himself to. He can't turn it off, can he? But uh, uh, again, I'm just. Uh, it's like when somebody that you know. And again, I wasn't at Vince's Christmas parties. Uh, but somebody that you think is okay, we know he's crazy in his own various ways, and then you find out that he's he thinks like Charles Manson. It's, uh, <sighs> and again, people should read the complaint because Vince's text messages are in the complaint. It has her timeline of events, and it has the actual text messages so you could see what she was going through, what was coming to her phone. You know, you're sitting at your desk, you're sitting at home, whatever it is, and all of a sudden these things start popping up on your phone. It's, it's, uh, you know, I can't. Well, yeah, and, and she, <laughs> he was, he was forcing her to do shit after she had signed the NDA. Well, after she signed the NDA, he still was forcing her to do shit. He, what is, he's completely insane. And then the stuff with what in the complaint is said to be a former UFC champion. Everyone's assuming the articles out there are all talking about Brock Lesnar. The idea that he was telling her that her sex with that wrestler was a part of the deal. <laughs> that she had to submit to whatever. Yeah perverted videos or anything the person wanted and allegedly he wanted a p video of her just urinating but 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 yeah he she has the text message of uh of vince saying that yes you're a part of the deal just flat out declarative statement see that makes you wonder too vince's relationships with top guys is there anyone else he had some kind of weird relationship with if this is true and <laughs> he's telling brock by the way, you got to do this. Here are the photos. Look on my phone. This is the girl. Just text her and she'll do whatever you want. And then he tells her she has to. Was this a tactic Vince used for anyone else? You know, here again, well, can you imagine uh, uh, Bret Hart being involved in anything like this? Uh, boy, oh, Jesus Christ. I could say that would have got over like a fucking lead balloon. No, but the idea and, that he went and, so well, heavy no, with Sean. Back, it, in the, back in the old days, there was rumors about why does he put up with this? It was Sean or with anybody that was supposed to be his favorite with the ultimate warrior. No, there was not that dynamic. I'm just telling you. It just, and, and, and again, obviously, this didn't take long to fucking come out and blow up. This is more than rumors. Uh, there was a lot of jealous guys coming up with fucking reasons to justify their positions in those days. This is text messages written down and things going to court. And they're requesting a jury trial. And there's no jury in the world that's going to hear these details as laid out here. I don't care who Vince has defend him. <laughs> How is he going to fight against all this stuff? It's in writing. Is he going to say, I thought she was into it? Is he going to say, I didn't think there were any problems? I mean, that's just anything with her and him, let alone anything he did illegal in his capacity to the shareholders, to the company and everything else, because it was on company property. Well, she was a now, company employee of a publicly traded company. She's, she's worse off personally now than she was before because... When he meets her, she's, as we said, she's upset. She, her parents have passed away, all the problems that she had. But now she's not been able to hold a job because she's afraid to leave her apartment. She got a job managing her building and couldn't leave her apartment to manage her own building. And she's got all kinds of after effects from all of this shit. And again, we don't know how old she is for sure, but I am leaning toward that she was in her early 20s based on the picture that we've seen and other things that we've heard and that she had had no employment history. She had to be a young person. And there's some newspapers that reported her as being older. But that brings up, this is only one of the payoffs. So who else is she maybe getting confused with or vice versa? And what were the higher fucking payoffs for than possibly than this? See, that's where it gets crazy. And some of the other payoffs apparently for talent. It's one thing, and this is all inexcusable and awful, and Vince should burn for it. But it's one thing with someone in your building that you bring into your office. This is a wrestling company. If he was doing anything similar to this, 
to any of the female talent, that's a whole nother story. Because, you know, talent talk to talent, and talent's supposed to look out for each other. And, uh, you, you know, I, well, I, at this point, you can't assume that Vince wasn't doing awful shit with other people if he was paying them millions of dollars, hoping that it would ensure their silence forever. And how many other people did he stop paying? Because we said that before. Which, he did it to this woman. He also did it to wrestling promoters. I mean, he's done this to other people where he makes a deal and he just decides, I've had enough of that deal. I'm going to do something else. He figures out some way that they broke it first. You know, what wouldn't the, the, the cover story on Calgary was that did Bruce Hart run a spot show at a fair somewhere up? Oh, yeah. Whatever. But <laughs> that's again, the, the, problem becomes not only the payments or whatever but i can tell you that with talent no i it, i'm not saying that nothing ever happened with talent because there wouldn't be an a, agreement etc and we think that there's probably something that's happened with the talent or two but no way that it was to this extent or in the flavor of what this was with this young lady because I Again, no way. That. Well, no what no way it could have been kept quiet. Hey, listen. Because the the girls in the locker room would share shit. No, they'd be scared that they're gonna get sued by Vince and Jerry McDivitt also. I think that's why a lot of people have been quiet for a long time. It's like the Colin Thompson thing. He wanted us to shut up. He right away started threatening lawsuits for tens of millions of dollars. We call this bluff. It's not that easy to call the bluff of someone who you know will just go as far as they can because they have more money than you. And it has to be an uneasy thing. There are stories I could say, there's a story I've heard, and I'm not going to give too many details here because it's not my story, uh, although enough people know it because the first person who I heard tell the story, I think, told lots of other people the story, and another person who's told the story was on the plane, but about Vince having one of the women perform for him on the plane in front of the writers and other people, and this was someone who ended up having a lot of problems. That's what he's doing publicly. If he's doing that in front of people that are his employees, he's doing that publicly. We don't know what he was doing privately. We don't know how crazy he is. This whole thing makes you rethink the Rita Chatterton story, where he pulled her into his limo, promised her the world, yeah, demanded a blowjob, and then just decided, I've had enough, I'm going to take you, according to what she said, and then threw her out of the limo, and then got rid of her, and then tried to get the athletic commission, I think, not to use her. I mean, Vince has a pattern, and if you read the details of the Rita Chatterton case, it's the same guy. It's not like this is what, what's happening here in 2021 or whatever, the, the 2019 to 2021 to currently, I guess, seems like the same guy that was accused of doing those things in the late 80s. The problem becomes now that... Well, I, I guess we, we've jumped ahead over kind of the lead. Vince is gone. Um, he resigned. Well, how many things did he resign from? The executive chairman of TKO. And was he on a board of something? Did he sell all of his share? Yeah, he's the chair. He was the executive chairman of the board. I don't, well, I don't think you can just sell that many shares. Just like just sell everything right now. I think doesn't that that takes a while to gather up and liquidate, right? But he's officially not holding any position of, you know, of, of, of not only of employment but of ceremonially on boards or in any way with the company. Because as soon as this, what was it like? Maybe four hours later, after the news came out of the lawsuit. Slim Jim said, uh, uh, we are deciding to pause our promotional activity for the Royal Rumble the following day. And you know that had to be some fucking money because it's the number two pay-per-view and they were the big title sponsors. And what was it? Was it a half hour after that we got the news of Vince's resignation? Yeah, I mean, it's very interesting how that happened. The day before... The Wall Street Journal article was published. The complaint started going around a little bit after that. Other news uh, organizations started picking up the story. CNN was running with it all day. I saw it on CNBC as well. Vince put out a statement, or his side did, 
saying that it was all false and he was going to vigorously defend himself. And well, it, it was all, all either false or distorted truths. He, he, there was that caveat in there. Alternative facts. Truth. Yeah. I Alternative got it. facts. But then TKO put out a statement and it was kind of the opposite tone. Vince McMahon is not in charge here. He's not running anything. And then as soon as the first sponsor, and it's a big one, they just announced, I think over yeah. the summer, like the biggest sponsorship deal ever with Slim Jim. When they announced they were pausing it, they did not wait. Vince was gone right away. And at this point, how could Vince have any friends on that board, or maybe friends isn't the right word, anyone who's sympathetic to him being there? It's now a complete liability for him to have anything to do with the company. You have to wonder if the name McMahon could be used anymore for this company. <laughs> Well, and, and that's, they had to know as soon as that news came out, they already had to be talking because the, it was going to be a waterfall of sponsors dropping out if they hadn't made an announcement and if they, you know, hadn't nipped it in the bud. So as soon as that news came out, I'm sure they were, whoever needed to talk to whoever was talking to them. And they probably said, well, let's see if anything happened. And boom, something happened. And there you go. But that they would have cost him a fortune. And, and like you said, I think, you know, it might be good if Stephanie came back. Stephanie might be the McMahon. Ooh, that, well, but think about this. In hindsight, she has dodged Vince every, every chance she could for the last two years, right? She left. Then all of a sudden he had to leave, so she came back, and when he came back, she left again. And was was Triple H, did he not at one point vote that maybe Vince shouldn't come back? Vince, Stephanie, and Nick Khan, all three of them voted for him not to return. Vince had the power to override everyone. Yeah, well, but so maybe she kind of was trying to do the right thing, or at least wasn't you doing know, the wrong thing. She's in a tough position. Triple H, and we could talk later on about what he said during the Royal Rumble press conference or what he didn't say or how he tried to address this or didn't address it, however you see it. Stephanie went on TV. If Stephanie, and again, we don't know who the unnamed executives in the complaint are, but if Stephanie's one of them, or if she, as a member of the board, was privy to the investigation and what its contents were, and if the investigation showed any of this, and we don't know if it did, because if they didn't speak to Janelle Grant or her, her attorney, it's kind of like the AEW investigation. It didn't speak to Lucy. It's not a real investigation then. But if their investigation showed any of this stuff, and Stephanie knew about it, and as, a, as an act that wasn't publicly known, did some things behind the scenes, including but not limited to walking back and leaving, coming back to help, leaving as soon as her dad came back, she still went on TV and led the audience in a thank you, Vince chant. That's fucked up. Mm. Like that, mm. That's Forgot fucked about up. that one. There are stories, and I'll say this because enough of them are going around, we could talk about it, but we don't know how true they are. There are stories going around now that one of the reasons, or in part, maybe Shane McMahon had previously left WWE going back almost 20 years because of issues with his dad, because of his dad's behavior, and that Shane wasn't like that. And that Shane didn't want to do those things, whatever those things were at that time. And that Shane and his dad, because they were so different personality-wise, it's caused a lot of issues. And that's why Shane wasn't really a part or privy to any of this stuff, you would think. Although he did come back to the company, he wasn't an executive, he was just talent. Well, yeah, and Shane... It, obviously more different now than Vince. Shane had a lot of similarities with Vince in that, you know, the energy and the, uh, the physical fitness, you know, uh, fanaticism and, you know, the gung-ho business, blah, 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 good stuff. But I, I've said Shane is a nice guy and he's got a nice wife and nice kids. And I'm not sure. The other explanation was also very plausible that Shane realized he wasn't going to be, because I don't think Shane's aptitude for the wrestling business was off the charts. Shane knew he wasn't going to be his dad in terms of running the company and went off to do his own thing. That's entirely plausible. I think at that point, 
you know, I'm not saying Shane might not have known that, you know, Vince was trying to, you know, inappropriately integrate himself with other women or whatever, but I, I can't believe that Vince would have even tried to pitch any of that to Shane. Could you believe that if either of his kids got wind of any of his behavior? Again, the behavior isn't just cheating. I can, I can, I can believe, I guess, if I sit down him pitching this to Laurinaitis because he didn't give a shit. I don't think Vince would have wanted to disrupt his son's entire family life and whatever the fuck. And go ahead now and ask me what you were going to ask me. Well, no, I mean, that kind of sums up a lot of it. But the family stuff's interesting because Triple H is still in charge. And based on the complaint... It appears that people knew something was going on in that office. They knew that Vince had a girl on payroll for one reason or another. Who knows how much anyone knew? Well, who knows what Vince shared with what people? Are we supposed to think that John Laurinaitis and his physical therapist are the two people he trusts the most in the world with this kind of stuff? How did that door open with him and Johnny Ace? Jeez. So we don't know. And, you know, he's talking about this stuff with Brock. Is there anyone else he's trying to impress? By showing photos of someone who didn't want their photos around there or talking about someone like this. We don't know any of this. The big thing is we don't know who knew what. The complaint has a lot of unnamed people. Was Kevin Dunn, who was, based on everything everyone always said before this, someone who was always there because of his relationship with Vince. Because he knew how to work within Vince's system. That he was maybe the second most powerful person in the company at times. What did he know? John Laurinaitis was involved in this. And, and uh, let, me, let me say one thing here about Kevin Dunn. I'm not saying that he didn't know anything or didn't know anything or whatever, and I could believe either story. Probably I could believe more that he did know everything and was, you know, he would never betray Vince, but I can pretty much guarantee goddamn to you that he probably was not involved. I don't, uh, never had long personal conversations with Kevin Dunn, but I'm I'm thinking he's, like a, a fucking person who would live, live vicariously through stories, if anything. And also, Lord. also the timeline of events. I mean, a lot of this takes place during the pandemic. Laurinaitis was all of a sudden made the head of talent relations again in 2021, remember? No one thought he would ever have that role again, or that he should. That was just based off things that people heard that wasn't this. And all of a sudden he was the head of talent relations again. That was funny. Here's another thing we should talk about. Let me pull up this tweet here. Bruce Pritchard all of a sudden returned to WWE a few years back. Bruce Pritchard, who most people didn't think would ever return to WWE because there were forces outside of Vince who really didn't want him there, who knew why he would be there. And also most people didn't think really had a function in the modern wrestling business going forward in the roles that he had previously had. Bruce all of a sudden got brought back let me pull up this tweet from yesterday, the day of the Royal Rumble, 12.51 p.m. Out of nowhere, Ronda Rousey, who left WWE several months back, made an appearance for AEW and Ring of Honor. Here's what she wrote. Bruce Pritchard is basically Vince's avatar. If he's still around, Vince still has a hand in the business. Vince was still running things through Bruce when he was gone, and gone is in quotes before and that is in line with everything we've ever heard or at least i've well, ever heard you could say what I you've mean, ever heard. well i can't argue with that as far as yes obviously bruce is now uh vince's longest you know running confidant now that pat patterson's gone and and laurinitis was not there for nearly the number of years bruce was and we talked about the time bruce gets it and what it is, whatever Vince wants. Bruce knows how to take Vince's sometimes, you know, cloudy instructions and disseminate it where Vince gets what he wants. I'm not saying it's going to be good or bad or indifferent, even, but that's just the facts. And Bruce is Vince's ears, and Bruce is Vince's eyes in a lot of cases. And so, yes, but. That would be as far as business-wise, as far as the company, as far as the tan. A lot of people, everybody thinks I'm out of touch, but every time I would actually go back and work with some modern promotion over the last five or ten years, 
They'd say, wow, he really helped me a lot, but Bruce is so old fashioned. But it, it, I. The fact that this was an I, open secret that Bruce was only there because he's doing Vince's bidding, I mean, she's saying what everyone knows. Well, yeah, but again, I'm saying with having known Bruce and known. <laughs> He may have known something was going on, and this is, Bruce Pritchard is a person who is so fastidious, he brushes his teeth with warm water. He refuses to eat hotel room service on the bed, even if that's the only place you can watch TV. He won't eat in bed. He has to eat at a table. He's scared of pickles. He is revulsed by pickles. And he's he's not a germaphobe, but he's a very fastidious person. And also, when they did the fucking Val Venus and Jenna Jameson shoot for Raw in 1997 or whatever it was, that was in the hot tub at Bruce Pritchard's house, and Bruce's wife, Stephanie, wouldn't let him hear the end of it because they let a porn star in her bathtub. And I just cannot believe... That, and nobody has said this, but I'm making a preemptive strike. I can't believe Bruce Pritchard being involved in any of these various things, but I can believe him covering his ears and turning his head and walking as far away from the thing as possible to where he wouldn't know any more than he had to know. I mean, it's hard for me to believe that Vince McMahon, when all of a sudden he's surrounding himself with all of his confidants, we all thought it was just a power grab for the company. We didn't realize all the other sick shit that was happening with the same confidants. Maybe not Bruce. Maybe not Kevin Dunn, but John Laurinaitis was there for a reason. Vince, again, everything changed the last few years. Remember, Vince all of a sudden had his old gang back around him. And this is what he was up to. And it's just, it's... In the office. I mean, that's the other thing. There are unnamed executives who Janelle Grant would walk past and they would treat her bad. Or some would treat her good, but everyone was aware that there was something with her and Vince. Yeah, she well, she introduced herself to one, and and they said, "Oh, I know who you are." Uh, and uh, and who is and that? Again, Th that's I, the thing. I, is that Stephanie? Is that Kevin Dunn? Who? When is I that? was there, when I was there, it was the era of the human resources department, and they ran everything, and you couldn't say boo to a fucking goose. And and this is, you know, I'm reading, again, I'm, reading, I'm, this, reading, I'm reading right now a book that you'll be reading soon, The Six Pack by Brad Bellucci, and it's coming out pretty soon. And he talks about like, the early days of WWF, how crazy it was in the office in the 80s when HR was Linda McMahon. And beyond <laughs> that, it was just a boys club in that office. So, again, it may have been different while you were there in the 90s, uh, but you could certainly say there was a weird if not at times completely toxic culture around Vince and the the way he wanted things set up for himself. But yeah, but now he's he's become maybe it's again, maybe it concussions, Alzheimer's, the drugs, the steroids, whatever the fuck. But in his 70s, he's become a fucking teenager. But uh, like a teenager with uh, like the fucking Twilight Zone episode of, you know, he's a teenager with omnipotent power and he's wishing people into the fucking cornfield. He's he's lost all element of his reason or even his risk-reward ratio, his uh, just willingness to leave himself open to this shit that you would have never thought the guy of 30 years ago would do just be this stupid about it. It's beyond yeah, stupid. If, if it's evil. Else. It's flat out evil, and that's the thing too. Beyond wrestling, I could I could believe Vince would be evil more than I could believe he'd be this fucking stupid. You know, beyond wrestling, if you look at the history of entertainment or just people of notoriety, people who are celebrities or top executives, no one goes out like this. Like this is just extraordinary. Like it's one thing going out and people hate you, or going out and you rip people off, or you're evil. This is as evil. I mean, this is, this is as evil a way to go out as anyone ever. The last things we're hearing about Vince are these completely deviant stories. And it's horror movie shit. Yeah. And it, and it wasn't even consensual deviance, which is nothing wrong with that. No. But it was, it was a fucking torture, psychological fucking... And physical. It, well, it, but I mean, psychological manipulation and then 
fucking getting this girl stuck in this situation and doing whatever the fuck and thinking you can get away with it. I, I'm, I'm astonished. Yeah, and again, there's no excusing Vince McMahon here. There's no excusing John Laurinaitis as physical therapist or anyone else that was aware or involved in any of this. And for anyone who was bothered or offended by my laughing at the initial thing as it was coming out in real time about dildos named after wrestlers or yeah. the defecating on the head, I'm sorry. We chose to put up on YouTube a real-time thing thinking the listeners would want to hear how we discovered it. And I'm sorry if anyone was offended by that, but that was my real-time reaction to hearing this. And then I read the complaint afterwards. And the Wall Street Journal article did not do a great job of laying everything out there. It's a serious thing. And we're treating no, it as a serious well, thing. And if anyone wants to clutch their pearls over this with us, go fuck yourself. The, the Wall Street Journal article was not 70 pages, which this complaint is, but they also... They skipped over a lot of the things that people would naturally want to fucking know and before they assumed that it was all a bunch of fucking hogwash. So, you know, they, they led with head defecating and dildos named after wrestlers, and how are you going to bring that back from parody? You know, it's just so crazy, too, because, you know, I don't know Vince. I never worked for Vince. I just know him as a television guy and for what I know about behind the scenes in wrestling. But when you read these text messages, it's it's almost hard to envision him sitting there writing them. I mean, it's not it's the same human being. It's, it, it's crazy. It, and I'm not even I'm not even the the depraved content, but just it sounds like the fact this is some illiterate teenager, and not the we talked about when we talked about Vince's melting appearance. The presence he used to have when he came in a room, imagine, and Aldous may hate me for saying this, but Nick Aldous, but he wasn't as good looking a man as Nick Aldous. But when he came in the room, six foot two or three or whatever, with the big shoulder jackets, the hair was perfect. You know, he carried himself like a fucking important person. You knew when he'd walked in, you stood up or sat up a little straighter or cleared your throat or whatever, paid attention. He commanded some attention and some respect with his, but this, not only in appearance now, but in action. And like I said, I'm not, I, I said I never saw him write anything, but he he didn't speak or dictate like this fucking drivel that you see in this, and again, she's Lawsuit. A, they're asking for a jury trial. We know that he's cooked. Oh no, he's done. I mean, the grand jury, uh, whatever happens here, he's done. And I think about this quote he had years ago. I remember him saying about when him, according to him, he used to get into fights with his stepfather growing up in the trailer. And he would get the shit kicked out of him, but his attitude became, I lived, so I won. That's his attitude. As long as I live, I win. And I don't think he deserves a win on this. I'm not saying kill Vince or anything, but he's got to serve time and he's got to pay her. I don't want to go into politics, but Donald Trump was just found to have to, the amount of money he had to pay the woman who won a trial saying that she was raped. 80 something million dollars. 80 something right? million dollars. This woman has text messages. This woman has details and dates. Of, of multiple, of multiple uh, participants. And what we've said before, we've talked about Vince is a more articulate Donald Trump with better hair, but now it turns out that fucking Vince is worse than Trump. Vince is Trump with concussions. It. Well, I mean, again, this is, uh, we can keep going over it. This is one of the craziest stories ever. This is maybe the craziest story in wrestling history. This is one of those stories that if things weren't going so well right now, could almost kill the business. It's that you big could, a deal. You could, you could write this as a movie and it might be uh, far-fetched. People would say, oh, come on now. Nobody would ever actually try to get away with something like this. And, uh, <sighs> any, before we move on, any closing comments about all this? Again, people were, have been talking about it. Some of the people who heard the YouTube clip were yes, not exactly and, pleased. And no, once again, God damn it. I'm sorry, when I hear in the Wall Street Journal that, of all people, Vince McMahon 
potential germaphobe is goddamn being sued for shitting on somebody's head. I couldn't fucking compose myself after that. And there was no way, and nothing has been reported to the present time that this came out, that anybody would think that anything like this had been going on. So, if, yes, if anybody's mad at me, I'm sorry. I'm not going to fucking make fun of it after we know the details, but good Lord. What, how the fuck do we expect that to come at us on a fucking weekday afternoon to begin with? So I do apologize. And you kind of hit on what the next big issue is going to be. Who knew what and when? And what were the higher payoffs for with other yeah. people? For how can, what can be any worse? How many women how haven't asked for payoffs? Those are just the women who have asked for payoffs or payoffs were offered to them. Are we to believe those are the only women out there? It, I mean, if, if there was a lot of, if there was any doubt and nobody really doubted it, cause you kind of see Vince doing it the way it was described, trying to grope the tanning salon lady or the, some of the other minor incidents as it turned out now comparatively of uh, you know those are pretty much proven too i guess at this point there are very few yeah. bad stories about vince that you could think about right now and not find a way to really believe i mean that it works like i said the rita chatterton story if you go get the details and then you hear you go read the complaint from uh from this thing it's the same guy it just it seems like the same guy there's always been questions about the dark side of Vince, whether it was the mysterious suitcase into the police with Jimmy Snooker that Snooker told everyone about. <laughs> and that we don't know anything about or any of the things with women or any of the things with the divas when that was a thing. And again, all of a sudden on TV, he became a different guy. And it wasn't just Mr. McMahon, the boss. It was Mr. McMahon has women all over him. Mr. McMahon has a thing with different divas. Like the, the genetic jackhammer. Yeah, you have to now you have to really wonder and you were out of there for all of that i mean you were gone <laughs> yeah i wasn't even there ladies and gentlemen yeah so i mean you have to wonder what was happening that you could argue that vince may not be the same vince you knew in 1996 no i you know you give a billion dollars and i i still maintain concussions multiple concussions late in life a billion dollars to a megalomaniac to begin with that never thought the rules applied. We've talked about how Vince never thought rules applied to him in benign ways or humorous ways or, you know, the ways that made a good story. You know, if, if I fucking run off and leave the cop trying to give you a ticket or telling the fucking rental car people that the fucking car is sitting on the goddamn curb at the airport or whatever. But you know, this is a drugs, brain damage, age, and deep dark shit in his head that he suddenly felt well fuck i can do anything i want i'm publicly traded by the way john laurinitis is the motherfucker that said to me jim Cornette, don't you cuss out those wrestling trainees we're a publicly traded company we'll get in trouble well fuck you john yeah it is interesting because we don't know how far back his perverted activity goes too uh, the dyna the dynamic dudes were not uh, were not noted for their perversion back in the day. Well, this is certainly one of the craziest stories ever, and uh, there'll be a lot more coming out from this. We could certainly say that, and we'll stay on top of it. We may have Stephen P. New on at some point to talk about some of this. Yes, because there's some legal ways that not only the the uh, not only Vince fucked up here, but as a person, but the WWE as a corporation fucked up which doesn't usually happen, maybe because this was done under the table and it had to be kept in a small circle because they handled it wrong. And then Stephen has ideas on how TKO, if they knew anything, might have handled this a little bit better retroactively. But If they got his phones or his electronics when they did the search warrant, again, this is what he was texting her, and it's disgusting and awful, and he thought she was cool with it. What was he texting Laurinaitis? And what was he texting that physical therapist? Because <laughs> that's going to be a big part of the story. It's not just what he said to the victim. It's what he said to the other people participating in the activities with him. 
Vincent, I, I don't, I can't imagine how, I mean, it's not even about coming back at this point, but he won't live long enough to fucking show his face in public again. Will he? And then, I mean, all those things, just all of a sudden he changed his face. I mean, there's so many weird things. Just well, whichever last... face he's wanting to show in public, I don't think he'll live long enough at this point to be able to do it without having rocks thrown at him. Yeah, he's really become the all-time villain. It's uh, a because, because before before he came back, I'll say this, and then we'll actually move on to something involving wrestling. Uh, before when he came back, or at least when he retired, remember he got the the uh the farewell on tv they came out and people gave him a round of applause and big cheers even though bad publicity because he was vince and he gave them their wrestling well i don't think they'll think that way anymore i think he'll they'll think he's vince and he tried to take a big shit on their wrestling yeah think about that moment now in retrospect that it wasn't just all right i'm off the board let me come by and say goodbye that was the board knows about all this nasty shit i've been doing but I'm going to still go out there and shove it in everyone's face and say, welcome to SmackDown. Yeah. And show them how much that the fans love me. He ain't good. If he lives to be his mother's age, he won't live long enough. I don't think to go out in public again and, and not get fucking hooted at all those wrestlers that went into the hall of fame should be happy that they were always told never to thank Vince. <laughs> That's an interesting thing. I mean, just what a maniac this guy was, and it's all about him and all about power and domination, and he didn't want anyone thanking him. But he also wanted everybody to know that he wanted everybody not to thank him. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's See what, what I'm right. saying? Yeah. Because that's even, a be that's even better than everybody thanking him. He he's like, I know you owe everything to me, but it'll make a rotten television program if that's the same thing everybody says. Yeah, there's a Curb Your Enthusiasm episode where they go to an art gallery and there's a, uh, a wall that's been dedicated by Anonymous. And as soon as Larry David gets there, someone's like, Anonymous is Ted Danson. Everyone knew it was Ted Danson. And Ted Danson <laughs> knew that he would look really good if he made it Anonymous instead of Ted Danson. Same thing. But uh, like you said, we've discussed this endlessly here and uh, I'm sure we will be discussing it more in the future. Well, as soon as somebody else talks about something. But in the meantime, before we get into the programs, real quick, uh, I was going to say, because we had so much going on on this show, I was going to save emails for next week. I've seen a few, not a ton, but this one got to me. This came in last week as it was anyway. I didn't want to wait too much longer. But um, it's from Christina. Won't give her last name. Uh, but she says, My fiance, Jonathan, John, was one of your biggest fans from Bartlesville, Oklahoma. He had triple bypass heart surgery on December 28th, and on January 11th, he passed away. He was only 40. His heart was not able to handle the surgery. We listened to your podcast together on repeat. It was one of our favorite things to do when we were together. My heart aches for him. We were together for eight years, and we're going to get married on October 1st. And she asked if we could have a moment of recognition for John, you know, on the show. And, and that just, yeah, you know, it, it makes me feel so bad when something like this happens, when I would imagine that Jonathan is probably the one that got Christine into our shows and, you know, but they were able to do something together. And then something like that happens. He was only 40. So Christina, we're sorry for your loss. Yeah. Very sorry, Christina. But it, on a more, a positive note, uh, Michelle and Andrew, who uh, we wish them well on their engagement back in oh in November 2022, and finally they got married on July 21st last year, and they just now sent me a picture. I don't know what took eight months, but nevertheless, well they were they were uh, uh, driven to do this, reminded to do this because. When we were reading uh, Russo's pitch to Direct TV, they got a special fucking uh, tickle out of that and realized they need to send their wedding picture. But anyway, congratulations, guys, Michelle and Andrew. Oh, good Lord. All right, uh, real quickly, I don't want to be too commercial at this time of rumble season, but I just want to make sure that everybody knew that the pictures are up, the information is up, and the 
Midnight Express 40th Anniversary Part 2, the final chapter, will be in full swing very shortly with action figure tag team sets of either your favorite combination of Midnight Express, Eaton and Condry, or Eaton and Lane, as well as the heavily bodied Stan Lane and Tom Pritchard. Under a thousand sets of the Midnight Combos and 500 of the Heavenly Bodies uh, tag team sets. And as we mentioned, and Brian, I will say now all the more, none of these will be remade or others produced in the future because after this year, and I mentioned one more Cornet variant, we're, we're going to get out of the action figure business because we're planning two and three years ahead of time and I'm starting to run out the clock. And to be honest, <laughs> with the way everything else is going in the world, I'm not sure that there will be a wrestling business in two or three years anymore. But um, nevertheless, the celebration for the midnight anniversary, we wanted to go out with a bang and make sure that these guys had the action figures that they deserve before we close this chapter out. Uh, all of them come in a beautifully illustrated display box. All of them come with autographed photos, depending on what you get of this, all the surviving members of our teams. And there's some packages also with books and, again, less than 50 of the autographed pictures, the last ones that we had that Bobby signed before he passed away. So go right now to jimcornett.com, and you can see all the information of what you get in each. And they start at only $99.95 for the people who couldn't afford the four-pack. And here's a heads up. If you want to order Jim Cornette merchandise, the Cornette face t-shirts, the Cult Cornette membership certificates, the books, the DVDs, or whatever, order before February 10th because all these figures go on sale February 10th at noon Eastern. We're taking all the other merchandise down like we did last time so that we can get everybody because it's still, it's just me and the feather bottoms, folks. And your orders will be locked in and everybody will get everything, but it's going to take us probably another six or eight weeks to process everything so we don't want to complicate the issues. So if you want non-Midnight Express merchandise, get that before February 10th. It's going to be down for a little while. And otherwise than that, then you can have us uh, forever immortalized on your office or display shelves in your rec room for our 40th anniversary and, and last one. I, Brian, I'm figuring out that the less that I associate with the general population and the more that I look forward to my retirement and slowing down and not doing as many things, I just want to read books and sit under the fucking tree. Every time that we get these more of these fucking stories, I lose my faith in a grand swath of humanity. I don't know uh, what to say about that. I mean, my attitude has been this is a dirty business. <laughs> you got to be honest about it. But it's a dirty world. But it's a dirty world. But this has always been an especially dirty business. And what Vince McMahon... I don't know anybody. You see, the, the other guy the, day, the guy the other day on the news, I'll say it in a minute, he was arrested <laughs> with a fucking human hand in his pocket. Just walking down the goddamn street. I don't... Was I don't, it sticking out of his pocket? How'd they get him? No, remember I told you that? Or was that the show that Solomon was on? Do you remember me telling you about that? I don't, but, you know, I, I forget these things. It was on the news. They arrested a guy for murder. And they ended up... When they arrested him, he had a dismembered fucking human hand in his pocket. So I don't trust anybody anymore. You never know who's got one hand in their pocket and the other hand on your fucking throat. Well, that's the yeah. wrestling business for you. All right, but I'm, it's a dirty, dirty world. It's a dirty world. I choose not to participate. If nominated, I will not run. If elected, I will not serve. Well, Brian, I guess what we ought to do before we get ready to rumble is just briefly go over because no, no earth was moved. No new ground was broken on SmackDown on Friday night. What was Friday night? The 20, 26th, 26th. Uh, the 26th of the, the month of January. Um, no new brown was brown was broken. None at no all. new ground was broken. Don't snicker at me. I'll I'll slap you for sniggering. Whatever happened to Ground Strowman? Um, that's a good question. What did happen to the world's strongest giant 
ground man with a beard. Then you got hurt, but <laughs> what? God damn it! What they? Do? <laughs> <laughs> you know what Arn Anderson said to fucking Mick Foley in 1989 in WCW after the Christmas break? Cactus had gotten in a fucking car wreck in uh, Long Island. Just you know. Not on a road trip, I don't think, just as he was home, you know, visiting his family. And he missed a couple of shows. And Arn had seen the fucking bumps that he had taken and been able to get up and walk back from and everything. So the first night that Cactus got back, he's sitting in a locker room. Arn said, you had to take time off for a car wreck. What'd you do, run off the edge of the Grand Canyon? <laughs> Anyway, so uh, no new ground was broken on SmackDown, uh, but it, it did set up more of the various issues at the Rumble. But did you know, let's talk about more aesthetic things on this television show and just observations rather than blow by blow. Maybe that's not a good term to use anymore. Play by play. The opening, they got the main eventers walking in the building while the announcers are billboarding things. They go to the package of last week's main event and the angle, the editing is top quality, but it just, it seems like they're open to the show. They're flowing better. It moves along. They're, they're, you know, upgrading things in terms of a tempo standpoint than just giving us the arena shot and hearing the announcers and blat somebody's music plays and out they come from the entrance way they're jazzing it up with the network look right and new head of production well that's that's what i'm saying maybe that is again we've heard that maybe some more changes will come to get it in more in line what are they saying how are they phrasing it with the an athletic presentation not actually coming out and saying, yeah, you know, like the UFC, but kind of what we've been maybe hoping for. Or like wrestling, like what wrestling's supposed to be. Yeah, well, imagine that. If, if they could have that groundbreaking idea, then, then we'd be all set. But, and it's Michael Cole and Corey Graves again, because poor old Kevin Patrick, you know, maybe he knew that he knew this time was coming. That's why he couldn't catch his breath. He was like hyperventilating, like, when are they going to fire me? When are they going to fire me? Where are you taking me? <sighs> what? <laughs> no, Wade! Oh! Wait, what do you mean? I thought I could stay in this country. Corey, Corey, help me. They're taking me away. Ha uh ha, -huh, hee hee, ho ho. To the funny farm. But it, thank you, very good. Uh, so they introduced a rapper. <laughs> And the the rapper whose name I can't pronounce or spell, I've never heard of. Obviously, I don't know if it's my demographic. But uh, he welcomed us to SmackDown and didn't do a bad job. And apparently, is he somebody, oh, oh, music guru? You know, I had the open on mute, so I saw him, but I'm not exactly sure who it was. But they were in Miami, so I'm guessing it's someone who uh, really has the beat. Well seen, but now you're starting to show your age a little bit, just that you don't know all of these people from sight. Because I go based on ear. You're talking music. I'm not like you, a superficial music fan, who I care about what the people look like. I care about the sound and the song. No, but yeah, what I'm saying, you rec you would recognize who this was if this was a person who you knew it was who. This was a person so talented in their craft that their image doesn't matter. It's about <laughs> what's happening on the record. That's what I'm oh. saying. Well, on the record, for the record, what was happening here was he welcomed us to SmackDown and introduced Randy Orton. And here came Randy, and apparently Randy is in this guy's music video. Uh, and he has done some tribute to the RKO or something. But anyway, Orton cut a promo on the bloodline, and he knows what he sounds like. He means what he says because he understands the importance of either doing in the ring or saying something in a promo that sounds half-ass real and convincing or just don't do that. So he talks in a way that he can talk and sound half-ass real and convincing. Wonder where he learned those type of things from. But anyway, um, so he, of course, is vowing to beat Roman Reigns at the Royal Rumble and he'll be a 15-time world champion. And suddenly AJ's music plays and he cuts the, and here we go. 
I think this is AJ's downfall from being it, it, when it's Roman and it's Orton and right now it's LA Knight and it's AJ. AJ's kind of fucking Zeppo, isn't he? Cause and well, no, I, Zeppo became a very successful talent manager. I don't think that's AJ at all. Well, yeah, now come on, now we don't know what he's going to do later on. His wife he's left still, him for uh, Frank Sinatra. He's still uh, AJ's. I uh, know uh, Zeppo. Oh, oh, all right. Well, th- th- we don't know what AJ's got a chance to do later on. He could become a great agent, or potentially, you know, fuck Frank Sinatra's wife. I don't know. There's still time, I guess. I mean, has to be someone There's, out there. Mia Farrow's out there. Well, there you go. I knew that he, he had at least one living ex-spousal person. Yeah, because he married her when she was 19. But anyway, go ahead. Well, but that's legal. Point out. He was like 55 years old, but go ahead. Oh, let's not even get into this goddamn (laughs) discussion. In light of recent events, what I'm saying to you is that AJ's phenomenal in the ring, and he's better verbally than he was in the TNA days, but I think his... His level of conviction and delivery and just whatever is uh, that I think is what uh, is his shortcoming. But thankfully, L.A. Knight's music played and he got a big pop and he livened the thing up and the crowd was chanting his shit and he cut a good promo on AJ and this is all about, you know, who's going to be the one to dethrone Roman, but L.A. Knight cut the fucking promo and said, and that's a fact of life, and he tossed the microphone down and walked off on him, and there's A.J. and Orton with their mouths open, and suddenly A.J. just flips upside down and just sucker kicks Orton in again and leaves him laying there and walks off. So, and uh, that's basically, they, they wanted to cover that match. They wanted to cover a couple of other things. On SmackDown here, the matches were secondary, even more more so than usual, I think. And maybe, it, was this a good fucking week for it anyway? Just keep them talking so they the crowd doesn't start chanting amongst themselves. I guess. I mean, with this thing specifically, I feel like the segments with the intrigue about who's doing what to who here and Randy Orton getting the, the moments where they just show him looking on, not knowing what to do, but he doesn't really say anything. <laughs> it's a lot more interesting than the actual match. Yeah. Cause then we, we got Escobar and Carlito. And remember a couple months ago, didn't we want to see this match on pay-per-view when it was fresh in our mind? We almost suddenly, did. We almost we did almost see this did. on pay-per-view. Yeah. And then suddenly we didn't. And then and now we did, but I you know, I wanted to see it and had time to watch it then, but neither one applied this week. So maybe did I miss anything or did you see this? I watched some of it. I think Escobar's really good as a heel. He's really, really, he was great as a baby face. You totally believe him as like the best friend. And now he's really good as a heel. They just got to do something interesting with him. <laughs> other than just feuding with everyone he's been with for the last couple of years. Yes. Or ever known potentially in, in, in his previous life, but uh, a big package on the jump to Netflix the Rock at WWE HQ, the new one apparently. They didn't have that high ceilings in the building I worked in. Uh, the the big board announcement, the whole thing. This is it's it's entertainment tonight wrestling where you get the talking and you get the packages on the big events, and then in the middle, the matches or the commercials. The only thing you don't have is the hosting. Entertainment tonight at least has like hosts to pitch to different things and host different segments. Here, it's just like anyone who has a microphone, go. Am I being led to believe that The Rock's daughter is now the general manager of NXT? I told you this would happen in terms of her being all over TV all of a sudden. She's now the general manager of NXT. She doesn't seem to be that good a talker or particularly uh, intriguing as a character, but all of a sudden she's in a role that will have her on that TV show more than anyone else on that show, I would guess. Well, but I mean, how, uh, I'm not even saying this in a derogatory fashion. How old is she? How long has she been there? Has she ever done television before? What's, uh, 
When did this happen? I mean, I know I ain't been watching NXT lately, but I thought I would have heard about this if it was more than a week ago. She's been there for a while because we did a story a while back about how they brought her in and immediately changed her name to something else. Well, but I know, but uh, I'm talking, that's not the general. I'm talking about how long she'd been general manager. When did this? Oh, how this did past you, week. I think uh, from what okay, I read. How did, how did she go from reporting for training duty to she's the general manager of the motherfucker? We ain't heard shit in between. From what I read, because I did not watch NXT, because despite how good people say it is, every time I give it a chance, it runs me <laughs> off again. William Regal showed up at NXT, the former general manager. And he went backstage and he talked to her and said that she's the new general manager. <laughs> I don't know much more than that. Obviously well qualified. She's a uh, seventh generation wrestler in some way, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> she's the great, 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 great granddaughter that wasn't of Nef Mayava. I don't, I don't know what's she's going on. She's the great, <laughs> great, great daughter of the great one. <laughs> or, but... I just, I, how did they present that? Has she even been on their television? She, and I think suddenly... she has. I, I want to say that she's been doing something on their show and it didn't light the world on fire, so now they made her general manager. <laughs> she had a stroke, so they well, made her head of talent relations. <laughs> <laughs> well, <Yeah. laughs> that's a good place to go so you can... Re <laughs> recuperate at a, a leisurely pace. All right. Um, Oscar and Carrie wrestled the or wrestled for the tag team championship or defended it against Chance and Carter. And then we had a little uh, vignette backstage with Heyman and Solo and Uso. Where Paul said, hey, Solo, you solved the problem, but you didn't fix the problem. Don't be merciful. And Solo takes off, and then Paul gets up in Jimmy's ear and gives him the big pitch to enter the Royal Rumble and do this and that and the other thing and beat Seth Rollins. And Heyman is captivating and brilliant to listen to. So, again, I enjoyed hearing this little soliloquy after that unfortunate choice of a match they presented but then the string of soliloquies stopped brian because <laughs> the in-ring with lashley and the street prophets at calling out carrion cross and what is the i haven't even remembered the name of the the un, unintimidated ministers what are they the, the bare final, naked ladies what the final is, testament the final testament it, apparently it's a multi-parter but the the street prophets go after the heels and scarlet jumps on lashley and then cross stops him and the heels are getting heat and they had to do a i don't even think it was bringing up the microphones i think it was actual piping in of the booing because you're looking at the people and they're like uh-huh uh-huh sort of like trying to tolerate that examination that the doctor just has to give you, but you didn't really want to go through. <laughs> How is it that everything that th this uh, carrying across this guy and this beautiful girl get involved in gets negative response. They bring back the fucking cheers they emitted in the previous segment. I don't know. I can't explain any of this. <laughs> I mean, even the faction, like with Paul Ellering, like, like what is he doing? Like what does Paul Ellering do? He just every now and then gets on the mic, but then he doesn't even go to the ring. He just stands in the back, and the other guys are out there, and and the other guys, and the Ooh. new T-shirt with the the cross, but you add a another line to make it an F for the final testament. So just the whole trying to make it some kind of religious thing too. I don't know. I don't know what the I, hell they're doing with any of this. Actually, I thought that was one of those dravas that they put at the end of the sentence for a, you know, a fucking footnote. But nevertheless, we got the rematch between Austin Theory and, and Carmelo Hayes, and neither one of them got hurt. They actually got to finish in. I wondered why they started at 100 miles an hour, because they were going so fast that Theory slipped and fell on a knee lift, his own knee lift, and then Carmelo Hayes fell on his ass on a drop behind. But then I realized they did all this shit in less than two minutes before the break. And then when they came back, they had like 90 seconds before the fucking bell. 
and a couple of big two counts and Hayes nailed Waller and rolled up theory and theory reversed it and hold the held the fucking tights. Boom. One, two, three. And then the heels jump right back on him and suddenly music plays. And did you see who it was, Brian? Do you remember who it was? It was trick. It was his friend trick. They've been friends from way back when we used to watch NXT. And he hit the ring and made a big comeback and shit canned all the heels. So they're they're fucking uh now they had a three and a half minute match and they're in an angle with Carmelo and a new guy who made his debut. <sighs> Any closing comments on that? No, this SmackDown is uh, just not that uh Yeah whelming, not even over or under, just not over or under. I'm not whelmed. So- well, let's whelm you with the main event because that's what we were all waiting for. L.A. Knight and Solo. And you know that's going to be a big fucking, you know, main event match that they're going to devote plenty of time to. So immediately they get into a big fucking schmoz and L.A. starts working on the guy's, you know, his thumb, try to nullify the spike, and they he smashes it on everything and they go out to the floor and Solo stops L.A. Knight with one blow, and they go to break in two minutes. What the fuck? <clears throat> and again, when they come back, you know, they're minutes from going off the air, but basically this isn't just an angle for, because they were they didn't even use the minutes that they had for, for match. A little more heat. And L.A. Knight makes a comeback, and the fans are with him. They chant big. The fucking yeah heads on the desk, and then suddenly you're watching L.A. Knight beat fucking Solo up, and from nowhere A.J. Styles just fucking levels him, and immediately the bell rings. Nobody even saw him coming. They must have dropped him in out of a helicopter, as Heard would say. And now he's beating up L.A. Knight, and fucking runs him into the stairs, and Uso has a chair because he was in Solo's corner, but he sets it down and offers it to AJ. And AJ slowly, now they've just completely slowed it to a crawl, slowly gets the chair, and Solo's like, yeah, hit him. Hit that no good LA Knight. And so AJ beats up Solo and Uso with the chair. And then here comes Randy's music. And he hits the ring, and he nails Uso and AJ and drops Solo on the desk. And DDT's Uso and DDT's AJ and RKO's AJ. And the crowd's ballistic for Randy. Wonder why? Haven't seen a fucking dominant campaign like this since Sherman's March to the Sea. And then, right as Randy's got the beauty shot and his music is playing and the announcers are pitching out to next week. And you think, well, wow. That was great. Boom, L.A. Knight comes up and gives Orton the BFT. And then they go off the air. So that was a nice little twist. But I'm wondering, are they making, as much as I love Randy Orton, he's a star, he's kicking the shit out of everybody. Are they making him too invincible when he's just recovered from back surgery and is maybe closer to the end of his in-ring career than he is obviously to the beginning and who are they gonna come up with can beat this fucking guy of course he looks great what do you think eh, i mean what do i think who's gonna beat randy orton well i mean if he is he kind of came in la night with i'm not even talking about aj but we've seen that la night and cody rhodes and now they've got cm punk and they've they've had a number of new faces, newer faces that they've elevated, but Orton has come in and so far he's the one kicking the shit out of everybody. Except in this instance, yes, LA Knight got him from behind with but goddamn is or is he just running away with it because he looks like a goddamn brick wall and all his shit looks good when he drops people on their fucking face. Yeah, but LA Knight's still the most over of the three. I, I don't from Randy's got the 
He's got the icon pop and the main event pop and also the sympathy pop from coming back from a serious surgery. So right now, I think they're louder for him. I don't think he gets that. You know, that's the one thing I disagree with. I don't think Randy Orton has a, a sympathy pop. I don't think people look at him that way. Well, I don't I don't mean the sympathy pop, but I mean the, oh, wow, we're glad we got him back because we might yeah. not have. Yeah, we're happy he's of, back. That, the, the, I don't think anyone's like, oh, poor Randy. I can't believe he's back. I never. No, I didn't. Never. All right, poor, <laughs> poor verbiage on my part or whatever then. Uh, but, but the, yes, that's, you know, that's basically the deal. I think, you know, they're glad to see him. He's been there so long. He's been at that level. So <laughs> well, you asked me the other day, are they cool in LA night off? I don't, I don't think so. I think just Randy's kind of running away with some of this. I don't know. It does feel like there are guys that, you know, not to compare it to AEW, but LA night got really hot and then, you know, things kind of have come down a little bit. Punk came in, it was the biggest thing ever. You know, they're still kind of fitting them into things. There's still a lot of stuff we haven't seen, but also The Rock came in right behind that. Again, not to compare it to AEW when they had like Punk and Danielson and Adam Cole and just one after another, boom, boom, boom. But it does feel like some guys are not... I don't know. You would think that if in a world where Punk did not come in, let's say, and when The Rock did not come in, they may have used LA Knight a little differently between Survivor Series and now. And I, yeah, but I agree with that. But at the same time, I don't think it's too late or anything. Or no, I agree to spell doom and gloom. I think it, it, unlike AEW, where they don't really follow up and people just lose track or interest, they've still featured LA Knight. He's just in a much more crowded forest, so his his blossoms can't shine quite as brightly. In, in the middle of all the other foliage. All right. Is well, that a good is that a good transition to how we can relax and and help calm our desperate minds after all the the things that are going on these days? Do you hear this wind behind me? No, nobody hears it. No, right. you do. No, no. This mic is really good. Do you hear the? Listen to the wind. Give it a ch give it a chance. Listen. I could hear a mouse pissing on cotton. It would sound like thunder. You hear it, though. In what I know, in what I'm... You do! Yes, you no. do! Yes! You hear that. Look, look at here. I'm, I'm, instead of going to the ear, nose, and throat guy, I'm going to start sending you to a fucking therapist here. Oh, come on. If you... I'm telling you. You know, as a matter of fact, here, what I was about to say might possibly help you in your current malady and situation with your apparent delusions and or what voices you're hearing or sounds you're hearing or commute telepathic it's thoughts wind, that you're picking up literal wind i'm seeing trees sway in the breeze of the wind that i'm hearing that you hear that you're denying because you know jace will edit it out and it makes me look like a fool well here's what can spark you right up boy can perk you right up into a better frame of mind our friends at cb distillery that's right that's who can do that because it, what it is is it's the stress, Brad. It's the pressure. It's like a heaviness hanging over you. Every morning you wake up, the first thing when you open your eyes, high heaviness. Oh, it's going to suck today. But see, you don't want to do that. Yeah, you want to be bright and cheery like old buck tooth Cheerio there. And that's why you need to clear out your your brain and, and you need to reset your health instead of all the other potentially over-the-counter synthetic artificial man-made homogenized ingredients that you might be putting into your body that might be who knows giving you incredible diseases of lack of which that we don't know and appendages of yours could begin rotting and falling off turning black don't do that don't do that no do don't even don't even mention that for any reason well, because it's a horrible thing to have happen. But if right now, if you start taking the clean ingredients, the highest quality, no fluff, no fillers, just pure effective CBD solutions designed to help support your health from CB Distillery, well, you'd be just right as rain because it's all natural stuff. It grows in the ground. I get, well, so do many toxic poisons but nevertheless they clean it first that's why they say it's clean ingredients they've scrubbed this shit with bleach and you know but they use bonami in some instances 
But in two non-clinical surveys, 81% of customers experienced more calm. 80% said CBD helped with pain after physical activity. An impressive 90% said they slept better with CBD. And I'll have you know that 3% spontaneously recited the lyrics to Inagata Davida. So if you struggle with a health, health concern true. of any kind. Not proven, not true. Well, it could, it could have been some of that mental telepathy. And, and if you haven't found relief for your various ailments and complaints and illnesses and things and such of that nature, then make the change to CB Distillery with over 2 million customers and a solid 100% money-back guarantee. If you take this stuff for the rest of your life and you don't live longer, well, they'll give you your money back. What? what? You said something in a way that took me aback. So I'm not exactly sure what you said other than take it back. Woo, 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 woo. Well, let's take it back. Let's get away from the Frank Stallone catalog and get back into things you could do to calm yourself. And of course, yes. CBD and seaweed distillery are wonderful. Here's what, <laughs> here's what'll work. <laughs> here's what'll work good for your blood pressure. You get 20% off if you listen to me. Right now, it'll cost you. 20% less than it normally would have if you were just wandering down the street and you wandered up on the corner CB Distillery dealer because you can go right now to cbdistillery.com. That's, that's the central location where everything works from. And you'll get 20% off if you use the code JCE. cbdistillery.com. Use the code JCE for 20% off of the cost of any of the fine products that they have that are encapsulate or are formulated or consisting of the CBD uh, for your CBDing pleasure. And Brian, what's that code again? JCE. See, now you're paying attention. CB Distillery. Oh, God damn with his fucking French fried Mar Mario's. <laughs> cbdistillery.com the promo code is jce is it not yes it is that's right well brian if we got a good night's sleep and got rid of all of our aches and pains and we were able to rid ourselves of anxiety and improve sores. our concentration sores sore well you might have some sores on you i've got really no lesions or anything but uh it, we were all ready for the royal rumble and boy, I didn't realize, I thought we'd need to get a good night's sleep to get ready for the Royal Rumble. I didn't know the Royal Rumble would put us to fucking sleep. I mean, How guilty, well, not guilty. How much of it do you think was the crowd? How much of it do you think was the wrestling? I'd, uh, well, I mean, the crowd liked what the crowd liked. And, you know, here's the thing, they can't hold a lot of this reasonably against the WWE as an entity now, because if all of the people who were gone or all the people who were involved or there or knew of the uh, things going on have either gone or are probably about to be gone, it's a new ownership and the, the boys, the talent, the girls, the rank and file, it's not their fucking fault. So if this had been, if this was a deal where <laughs> Vince still owned the company and everything was still as before, the whole WWE would be fucked. But I don't, I don't think the crowd was holding back because the news had dampened it that much. I think it just wasn't really that fucking stirring. I mean, there were moments and, you know, they did get up for what they like. They just, it, it wasn't that much there that they liked or that we liked in this thing. I it just, it did, the cake didn't rise. That's my opinion. And, and the thing is, if you didn't like something, you were stuck with it for a long period of time because now there was only four matches. AEW has 13 on a fucking pay-per-view. WWE's gone down to four. And two of them last an hour and a half apiece. So it was just, it... It was a four-hour show, and it was a bit of a schlog. What did Hulk Hogan add to the Open? Did they get some kind of Tampa tourism fucking payoff to do that Open? 
I didn't see the open, but in the middle of the show, I was watching something with Hulk Hogan. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I guess 40 years of Hulkamania. But no, it was him pitching the beauty of Clearwater Beach. Yeah, <laughs> so, well, the cold open, know. too, centered on, you know, not only the rumble, but the, the great history of the Tampa area. And oh, no, what I, I saw it, was a flat-out yeah. commercial for... Oh, yeah, Saint no, that was, that was in the middle. Yeah. That was in the middle. Yeah, <laughs> come down and visit our beaches and hang out at my store, and Ron Howard can fucking <laughs> tell you all the latest conspiracies. Brother. So, anyway, they had Michael Cole, Corey Graves, and they introduced Pat McAfee. McAfee was back on commentary, so a three-man booth for this one. But they led with the R Women's Royal Rumble match, and Brian... I think if anybody doubts what you comments you've made in the last several days on one of these programs about basically there not being a lot of depth in anybody's women's division, did this prove it? Did this prove it? It proved that there are a lot of women who it seems are taught how to do moves or move around, but aren't really taught how to work. And there are a few women who really stand out. And you say, geez, that person's a star. And then there's a lot of women just running through moves. And not everyone works at the same speed or could do what's in their mind, and it ends up being a sloppy mess at times. The crowd wasn't really into it, but to be fair, they weren't really into much throughout the whole show. It was a weird stadium crowd. <sighs> But I mean, with the you you mentioned they they can do moves. A lot of it is adapting their cheerleading routines to throw somebody down on the mat instead of have them land back on their feet. And otherwise, that's the wrestling. And it's just so much like running, like getting in just right away, running and doing the move that you rehearsed. And herky jerkiness. Yeah, there's a lot of that. So I'll give the uh, the participants in order. From one on down, Natalia, Naomi, she's back, didn't bring the Flying Burrito Brothers, Bailey, Candy LaRue, Jordan Grace from TNA with the belt. Remember, they did that with Mickey James last time, so they've said, okay, you know, TNA is no threat, so we'll do something with them. Well, hold on, let's talk about that real quick. I actually thought she looked pretty good in there, all things considered, but... WWE working with TNA, it's a very interesting time. Again, new ownership, things happening with New Japan, Tony working with different promotions throughout the years, calls it the Forbidden Door. <laughs> it's an interesting time for WWE and their new management to be working with other companies. I, I but, but they did this last year with Mickey James, remember? And then they ended up with Nick Aldis, who they're, they're married, he and Mickey, you know, coming into the company. Um, Mickey's now work. Is she working with TNA? Is that where she's working? Or no, she's I said else? Aldis came oh. in. Aldis, well, no, Mickey was in TNA last year and appeared in the Rumble, or two years ago, maybe. Two. Well, I thought it was last year. Was it last year? I don't know. Point is, there's precedent. And I mean, it's you know, did a lot of people there know who the fuck TNA is? Much less Jordan Grace. I think it's a bigger deal to the smart fans than it is to the general population. And, and again, they, they don't see them as any threats. So if, if yes, if there's some kind of talent exchange on a limited basis, I don't see them going whole hog with it because who has TNA got that the, the WWE has an embarrassment of riches right now on the roster. And why would they want to bring somebody in part time and focus on it? Yeah. Yeah. I remember in 95 or whatever it was, Dick Murdoch showed up in the Royal Rumble. There was always... Well, no, Murdoch was working there. Murdoch worked there for uh, uh, close to a year and didn't do Backlund? anything. They just, they brought him to, well, a couple of times, they brought him to TV. They, they, see, that was what saved me right before I went up there full time. I was just, I was tired out from Knoxville and Smoky Mountain Wrestling and I'd go up there and... At that point in time, I wasn't doing a ton on camera, but the, but it, it basically it was a chance to talk to Dick Murdoch and fucking hear bullshit, funny old stories was the most entertaining thing about the TVs during 95 ish. Um, he was in every TV. There. Yeah, he worked there for a long time. They couldn't figure out anything to do with him. 
but everybody liked having him around. And I think Vince just said, ah, if I, it's Murdoch fucking pay him. We'll do something eventually. And then they didn't, but he was there for quite a while. Anyway. Um, so after old Jordan Grace was Indy Hartwell, Oscar, Ivy Nile, Katana Chance, Bianca Belair, she woke him up a little bit. Yeah, she got a pop. See, that's part of the problem. A lot of these women got introduced and their music was really loud and no one moved and no <laughs> one made a sound. And when the music went down, it was silence. Silencio. That's a weird, it's a weird reaction. It's hard to not focus on that when everyone starts getting that weird reaction. But then, like you said, the stars like Bianca got a big pop. And then we were Carrie Sane, Tegan Knox, Caden Carter, Chelsea Green, Piper Niven, Zia Lee, Zelina Vega, model girl from fucking Dupree Models. She fucked up her first spot. <laughs> and just uh, fucking, they all fell in a heap. Nia Jax, people kind of went, oh, instead of, yay, it's like, oh, this could go either way. She moved like a glacier. Hey, at least she's presented like a star. You can at least give her that. They present her like she's, you know, better than yeah. she is, but they present her like a star, and the fans at least act like it. So really, we had, we've got Nia, we've got uh, Bianca, and <laughs> number 20 in was, was Shotzi, and basically we've had Nia and Bianca that people take as stars. And then here came Becky Lynch. And again, they like her. So now we got three out of 21. And then Alba Fire and Shayna Baszler and Valerie Halla. And then one of the biggest responses so far was when R-Truth came to the ring. He ran past old Val Halla and was going, where, where's all the guys? He was trying to enter the women's rumble, thinking that was his number for the men's rumble or whatever the fuck. And he looks around and Nia shit cans him and then Pierce kicks him out of ringside. And then Val rolls in and Nia shit cans her too. So, and then she runs after the truth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she can't handle the truth. I, I'm it's sorry to say it. I'm very sorry to say it. I am entertained by the R-Truth stuff. He's so committed to the stupidity. I'm entertained by it. This guy's a former NWA champion. I'm so entertained by just how committed he is to this. <sighs> it was the highlight of the match so far. <laughs> that, and unfortunately, you are correct. And then Mia Yim. And then Zoe Stark. And then Roxanne Perez. And then we're up to number 28. Jane Cargill makes her debut. Jade. Or Jade. Although Michael Cole sounded like I called her Jane. <laughs> well, they may change it slightly, uh, you know, just so they can trademark the thing. Nah, Jade's a star. Um, she goes into the ring, has a face off with Nia Jax and. Fireman's carries her and drops her kind of awkwardly, but gets a big pop and then picked her up for a slam and dumped her over the top rope and got a huge pop. And then she fought with Becky and that, so that, you know, then she ran into the post and they were all selling. So out could come Tiffany Stratton, whoever the fuck that maybe she looked like seven other girls in the match. And then that's my favorite spot. Everyone lay in a corner. Yeah, just lay in the corner. Here comes a girl. <laughs> and in number 30 was Liv Morgan. We got to put up with this again. She came down all minute. And we were an hour and 10 minutes into the pay-per-view, and there were still like eight or 10 girls in the match. And finally, it got down to Bailey and Liv and, and Miss Cargill. And that's where I was like, what the fuck? Poor... Jane, Jane, who thought that it was going to be a good idea for her to try to work with Liv Morgan because she's green, but she looks like a star and Liv is rotten. And it looked like two women fighting in a zero gravity simulator at NASA. Just, and then they got stuck in the ropes. Cargill and Morgan get stuck in the ropes while Morgan's trying to give her a finish and Cargill catches her. 
and Bailey runs at him and had to backdrop herself over both of them to the apron because nothing else happened. Bailey just ran and vaulted over him. And then Charlie Cook. There you go. <laughs> it wasn't a split legged leap, though. <laughs> and then Cargill dumps Liv over the top to the apron barely. And then uh, Bailey and Liv pull Jane over to the apron. And they have a sloppy struggle. And now at this point, Miss Cargill is holding her top up with one hand because it's almost coming out. And Liv knocked her to the floor, and then Bailey pushes Liv to the floor. So Bailey won. Miss Cargill was in for too long. And what the fuck does anybody see in Liv Morgan? Is my thought. After an hour and 20 minutes, we determined a winner in the first match. Well, Liv Morgan's pretty. She's got weed. Drives fast. <sighs> That's dope. That's dope. Badass. Um, I was really happy to see Jade here. I was hoping that she would be in this because I see some of the other women who get used on TV and she's not that bad. So there's no reason for her to still be hidden and away. But it's, it started out great and they were putting her over and then it was too long with girls that can't. Is this, a, if you're not, and again, wrestling today is so much different than it used to be in just in terms of experience and how often you do things. But if you're relatively inexperienced, even though Jade's been on TV and working for AEW for several years, relatively inexperienced. Is it hard to be in a situation like a battle royal or a Royal Rumble where there's yes. people everywhere? You don't know what to, not that you don't know what to do, but there's a lot to be done. Yes, it's crowded. And sometimes you can't call all of that. A lot of times somebody will go to guy or girl would go to somebody and say, okay, let's do our spot. But in the meantime, they're having to keep, occupied while they're setting up their spot that they prearranged. And that's where you get a lot of this wild swinging or grabbing and whispering or what I don't I don't know what the fuck's going on with, but yeah, if, and he, Cargill was the same as Mark Merrow in WCW in AEW, they taught her to go out and have seven minute matches with girls that aren't really good. Sometimes they didn't last that long. And it was all about putting her over as unbeatable. That doesn't, th that's all he did with Mark Mirror was teach him how to be Johnny B. Bad, have the eight minute match and work the gimmick. And it, they have to be completely, it's worse than starting from scratch because you've learned bad habits. And obviously, Mero never recovered, but hopefully, Jane will. And now with Bailey, they have the story will she challenge? Her fellow damage control friend, EO Sky? Or will she challenge Rhea Ripley? Boy, she better keep Rhea Ripley's name out of her fucking mouth. Well, Bailey's good. Well, yeah, but I mean, again, it's it, that makes natural sense for Bailey. That's the... The other girls have been conspiring somewhat against her or clicking uh, up with each other in her group, and that makes sense with that. But I don't want to see Bailey against Rhea Ripley because it stretches credulity that she could give Rhea any kind of contest, doesn't it? Boy, they need Charlotte back sooner than later. That's going to be nine more months or whatever. Anyway, can we move on? Yes. The four-way title match. was, <laughs> And they did a nice history package, right? And, you know, we got... Uh, but we... <laughs> We get a lot of filler, even on these pay-per-views now, between the plugs and the different things. The girls' uh, rumble was out at an hour, 20 minutes into the show, and by the time they did a history package and got the four-way title match entrances in the ring and the introductions for that match done, it was 20 fucking minutes in between. So, and also during LA, before LA Knight's entrance, they cut from AJ Styles' entrance to an L.A. Knight and Bianca Belair Slim Jim commercial shot on location some fucking where with actors. We got a commercial in the middle of the introductions. Do they do that in the UFC? I haven't, watched, I haven't watched the UFC in a while. I don't remember them going from 
you know what? Here's the next competitor coming into the octagon, and all of a sudden that guy, they're playing a fucking commercial for goddamn Reese Cups or whatever. Anyway, when they rang the bell for this match, obviously, as I said, 20 minutes after the previous match had ended, it's a four-way. AJ Styles, LA Knight, Randy Orton, and Roman Reigns for the title. And you can't you can't really describe the play-by-play -play on this or what the story was that was being told because it's while as we've established it's a great idea to have four of your top guys or maybe the four top guys fight for the title. That's a great idea, but then you have to have the match. And these guys are, they're all over, and their work is excellent, great technically. And these guys probably do a four-way match as well as you can do a four-way match. But it's moves, it's not a match. You can't suspend your disbelief. The rules are ridiculous. People just jump in and begin wailing away on fucking people in the match that are not in the match, and the referee has to turn around because it's no disqualification. You can beat a guy who's not the champion and still win the title. So I just, I can't, I can't. But I love all these guys. Well, I like, I love everybody but AJ. I kind of like AJ. Uh, but as far as being the top level guy, he was the, the one that you figured if they were going to beat anybody, they should beat him. And eventually that's what happened. But, uh, you know, they're having their match and then, they just take these right turns where Solo comes out and pulls the referee to the floor to break the count when it looks like Orton's going to win the thing and beat Roman. And then Solo spikes Orton, and it gets in the ring and spikes L.A. Knight and puts L.A. Knight on top of Orton, and the referee's just walking around limping, and the announcers are saying, well, it's no disqualification, so you can't do anything about this. And then Solo charges AJ, but AJ moves and Solo goes through the barricade. And then AJ blasts Roman and covers all three of them and all three of them kick out. And then it just, that's the thing. Everybody's got to hit their goddamn move and turn. They use a chair. And then finally, LA Knight hits the belly to back, hits the LA elbow on Roman, goes for the BFT. So many initials here. But Roman pushes L.A. into A.J., and then Superman punches L.A. and then spears A.J. One, two, three. So for a four-way match of any kind, it was fine, but for a dramatic world championship wrestling match between a dominant champion and a fucking fireball challenger or whatever, it's not close to what you can do there in a single match. It just, it just happens till it quits happening. Am I being too hard on it? Again, the crowd reactions hurt things all night, I think. Especially here. I thought the action really got interesting towards the end. If you can get past the fact that it was a sloppy mess. <laughs> the way things were kind of timed and the way big moves were hit. Yes, they were doing it very well. They were doing it really well, especially at the end. Although the finish kind of fell a little flat. I don't know, you couldn't have had Roman beat one person and just had a good singles match? It's kind of a waste of a few of these guys. The Rumble could have used them, quite frankly. I mean, you know, this was... Uh, when we first started doing the monthly pay-per-views, whenever that fucking was, and in, right when, in early 96, when I joined, they had, they'd started... They'd been six months by that point when I joined the creative team. And this would have been what Vince would have described in those days as like a, the in your house main event or the B level paper, like a February pay-per-view or a May pay-per-view. Don't waste your big singles match that will really draw the money and that everybody wants to see. Give them a multiple person match or whatever, but this is the Royal rumble. How much bigger can you get? Right? So, it's just a lot of these things have become habits because they've been doing it for so long. And unfortunately, I think now that is bred upon itself to where they just think, well, this is the way we've always done it. And everybody just expects, okay, we don't, we don't really care about uh, seeing the 
matchup between Ali and Frazier as much as we care about seeing six guys with boxing gloves in there swinging away at each other with chairs. It's not the big match anymore. It's just the fucking overbooked match. Yeah, I don't know. Did it was, you like, it was like they wanted Roman on this show and they wanted these guys on the show, but like, who comes out of this match for the better, really? It's not really. It doesn't really feel like a big Roman Roman Wayne's Roman Wayne's win. Roman Wayne's win. It doesn't feel like one of those. I mean, no one's talking about no, Roman he, Reigns' match was, or anything. He was hardly in this. The all the attention was on which of the other three was going to fight each other or fuck each other around. But uh, you know that that's the thing is if if you like all of these guys doing all of their moves to everybody and they, they gave it at least some element. It's not like one of the trampoline cowboys productions over in the Indies or AEW, same thing. Whereas at least AJ is in a gray area now where he's, you know, being heelish LA Knight and Randy Orton, even though they're both full fledged baby faces still have a reason that they can grate on each other because LA's a new guy. He's come in since Orton was gone. They don't know each other. And then Roman's full-fledged heel and blah, blah, blah. So there are at least the right dynamics in this, but, and it's not just a spot fest per se where everybody's doing ridiculous vaulting and aggressive parkour, but it just, it doesn't make sense as a wrestling match. You can't. You said AJ's in a gray area. I understand he's very big with the gray community. What, what do you mean, the gray community? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> so now we're two hours into the into the program, and we have literally seen the end of the second match, right? So we go to the U.S. title match with Logan Paul and Kevin Owens, and this time it was only 15 minutes from the end of the world title match to the beginning of this match. Uh, but uh, now... You've got two guys in a single match that have to follow four of the biggest stars in the company that had to follow 30 fucking girls for an hour and a half. So maybe that might be why the crowd was petering out by this point, and it's been two hours already, right? So Owens, as, as advertised, and as he said, he didn't have a cast on his hand. He was wearing a wrist support and some black tape. And he was throwing left-handed chops, but uh, Logan Paul, uh, by the way, is getting raves and from everybody, and he should. He's a natural. He was able to take over and work on the hand, get heat on the hand. He unwrapped the tape like an old-timer. I mean, after uh, Logan Paul got his ass kicked and he can sell, and his timing, his athleticism, his heel attitude, and when he's getting the heel on the bad hand the way he's twisting the finger, he gets little things that are not honestly easy for a lot of aspiring wrestling school students and even professionals to pick up on. It's just amazing how far he's come with this. But great heel heat. And then Owens made a left-handed comeback, a couple cannonballs and a frog splash, and they start going into their big moves and two counts. and trading the swantons and finally logan paul hit the big right hand boom and dropped him and cover one two two count and uh, logan paul oh shit his big move didn't didn't work didn't pay off and then here comes one of logan paul's i get his internet stooges his youtube show wherever is a guy in a white shirt to the average person Yes, he's always identified as one of, you know, Logan Paul's consorts or cohorts. I, I better look consort up before I use that again. Anyways, security blocks this guy off, but here comes Austin Theory and Grayson Waller. And Theory slips Logan Paul the knucks, but as he tries to stand up and use them, Owens grabs him and takes him away and nails Logan Paul with the knucks and covers him and the referee counts one, two, and points at the knuckles on Owens' hand and sees them and calls for the disqualification. Oh, boo! And actually, I like that. It was a nice fucking wrestling finish. 
from back in the old days. And the program isn't over. That's obvious because not only from that finish, but then Owens jumped Logan Paul and power bombed him through the desk. I wouldn't have done that. I'd have left with the fucking prick having some heat. Because then that makes Owens, what are, what are they going to have next? Maybe a taped fist match. I don't give a shit. But they get heat on the, the heel for cheating and winning, and then the baby face gets to fucking power bomb him or whatever through a desk. But it wasn't bad. And Logan Paul is, I'm a huge fan. They've got, He's another top guy in this category. Instead of getting over as a wrestler to become a major star, he got over as a star and then became a wrestler, but he's not, he's the furthest thing from bad at it. So I can't knock him. Your thoughts? I thought it was all right. The crowd reactions again hurt the match. I don't know who this guy was. Again, I don't follow the world of Logan Paul. I guess if you do, you know who he was, but it was just a guy in a white shirt. And it was a clever, I thought it was a pretty clever finish. I thought it was well done. Logan Paul doesn't seem out of place in there. You know, you know, that's a dusty spot, by the way. And I know he might have stole it from Eddie Graham, but remember the rock referee roll, catching the, something on you, the referee catching something rock and roll and midnight. We did a version of it two different ways. One, I would get in and whack somebody with the racket. But when I put my heel on top of the guy I knocked out, I would accidentally leave the racket to go get the referee and revive him so he could count it one, two, and then he'd, his hand would come down for the three, but he'd grab the racket and hold it up and people would go crazy. And another one, Big Bubba would come in and give the Bubba slam to Ricky Morton, but his hat would fall off and he'd roll out of the ring real quickly and I'd slide the referee in and the referee got one, two, and grab the fucking hat. And as soon as he would hold it up, everybody would fucking go cray. Yes, yes. And then there you go. And that, that was a dusty. But anyway, um, you know, that's, that's the thing is that, you know, it, it's a creative wrestling finish that we used to get in the old days that would necessitate a rematch or a DQ or just a way to get out of something and go to the next thing. It, it, it's 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 a nice little throwback. It makes some sense here because they're obviously going to have another match. So we shall see. Are you ready to rumble, Brian? Yeah, once again, only four matches here on this show. Three That's matches in the Royal Rumble. Hey, it, it, it's been the 1920s since there were two fucking matches an hour and a half long on a fucking wrestling show, though, hadn't it? How could you have six or seven matches when two of them last an hour and a half apiece? That's a good point. So the men's Royal Rumble is what we were most anticipatory of because we want to see it with Punk, with Cody, maybe even, you know, uh, Gunther as a dark horse or Drew McIntyre. What's the, there was different ways they could go here with this. and But at the same time... <sighs> You got 30 guys. You got 30 spots to fill. And I mean, I know there were always underneath guys that were booked in the Royal Rumble. Some as fodder for the Giants. Some as just a break to settle people down for the next big peak. But it seems like even the middle card guys in the, in the 80s, late 80s and through the 90s and the Attitude Era, were more over with people, had more interest, had more reaction enough to keep this thing going to where people were caring instead of just, again, it wasn't as bad as the girls' Royal Rumble where there's 30 girls and four of them got a reaction. But there was, <laughs> there's, it's showing the weaknesses of the roster here in a few of these. Not necessarily they're bad talents, but people don't care necessarily about what they're doing does that make sense to you you know i was really looking forward to this match specifically and it was a letdown for me and i guess it's so weird i get the crowd reaction the crowd not reacting to a lot hurt things but there are just a lot of people who run out there and when you really think about it like why what has been presented <laughs> of them to make someone care about them they have a name that's slapped on them not even a gimmick just a name and they run out there. Here's Frederick Stevens. Here he is. 
Here's Mr. Poppenheim. You know, there's not a lot of people that are actually over and get reactions, and I'm sure we'll talk about it. And once again, our truth got one of the biggest reactions of the whole night during this match. Well, but also, you miss Pat Patterson. Pat was there for those 90s rumbles that were nail biters. You miss Pat Patterson in a situation like this because I think Cody made a big comeback uh, when he got in. Gunther had shit to do. Braun Breaker was phenomenal. This, to me, it was the Braun Breaker show because we're getting a glimpse of the future. But Pat knew how to set shit up where when a guy hit, the right people were in the ring for to feed him, for him to make an impact, for him to chuck out. Another thing, I've, I've had guys in, a, in several Royal Rumbles that I've managed, and they took get to the fucking ring. They were burning daylight. Everybody walked to the ring for the most part. Sometimes they'd get, you know, they'd they'd get close and then they'd run, put on a spurt of energy. Uh, Cody had to wait for his fucking pyro and his whoa. But it, it like there's so much time being taken for them to go in this stadium down this long aisle. It just it doesn't have the pace that it used to. So. We started it's also out 90 with, seconds now, not two minutes. I thought it was two minutes still. 90 seconds, I think. Well, God damn, then how does it end up lasting so fucking long? Hawaiian Brian time. Oh, uh, no, no, no worries, bro. Um, or bra. It's, it's, bro, it's bro in New York and it's bra out there, isn't it? Out where? In Hawaii. Out there in Hawaii? Is it bra or bruh? I mean, maybe amongst the uh, the Howleys like you. I don't know if uh, the Islanders are actually talking the way you are. Well, bro. whether it be whether it be bra, bro, or bruh. It ain't really bro out here either. That's kind of a misconception based on one notorious person who... One disreputable yeah. <laughs> individual who's poisoned the, the pool for everybody. I've never called you bro ever. Not well, the, <laughs> the brothers Uso started out Jay number one and Jimmy number two, and they had a match back and forth. And that was a nice way to start out. But then the number three was Grayson Waller and he's got a microphone. He's cutting a promo on the way to the ring. It doesn't do anything for the energy level. Right. And then number four, their surprise debut. Imagine this. Wouldn't you know who won the contract? Andre has returned. Uh, it, it didn't work when he punched Sammy Guevara in the face. He had to sit home and take almost a year of Tony Khan's additional money. And then number five was Carmelo Hayes. And at least at that point, Carmelo dumped Waller. I was like, okay, things are looking up. And I'm watching this in real time. I'm not zipping ahead, which is why it was so burdensome. Number six was Nakamura. Number seven was Escobar. Number eight was Karrion Cross, And I swear to God, I was nodding off at this point to begin with. But when Cross entered, the crowd went to sleep. And at that point, I did pause it because Harley needed to poop. And I took her out instead. Instead of watching whatever Cross was doing, that's how interested I was. We were three hours into the show at this point, And we ain't got ten guys in the men's rumble. So then, we came back from Harley's pooping session, and number nine was Dominic Mysterio, and finally, somebody woke these people up, because they don't like Dom, and they like to boo him. And that woke the people up, and then, number 10 was Carlito, and he got a nice little reaction when he leveled... Uh, one of the fucking heels, I can't remember, and grabbed the apple out and bit it and then spit the apple in Escobar's face and dumped him. So people like that. But then they'd quiet back down. And number 11 was Bobby Lashley. And here he, everybody was walking down like they're going to get the mail. And at least when Bobby got close there, he fucking rolled in and he speared several people and he eliminated Carlito and Cross. And that's what they, they always have, and this goes back to a Pat Patterson blueprint, but when you've got a physically dominant guy that you give a fuck, a big guy, whatever, that you give a fuck about using, 
in any way, you always give them a good, impactful entrance into the Royal Rumble, and they have to dump a couple people. So this was the first exhibition of that, but then Cross on the floor pulled Lashley out over the top rope. And the AOP, what does that stand for again? Age of... Authors of pain. Aesthetics. Authors, Authors of, of pain. Whatever. They beat him up until the street profits come out and they get in a big fight and nobody really cared in the crowd as they fought back down the aisleway. But you have a guy that's been eliminated pulling a guy out flat in front of the fucking referee. And again, they say, well, we can't do anything about it. Has that precedent been set? Is I understand a distraction by the guy on the outside, and then somebody inside dumps the guy, but have we set... Didn't Vader do that in the Royal Rumble at 96, and it didn't count? What is your question of what counts? If somebody that's already been eliminated can just get in just and, and throw people out. out or just pull people out or whatever. I feel like at one point that was something they did not allow, and then at other points it's something they just allow for whatever reason. I, I, and again, it's been 20, my God, 28 years now, but in the 96 Rumble, I think that's how they got, they got Leon out on some kind of distraction elimination, and then he came in and beat a bunch of people up and tried to eliminate them, but it didn't count, because that's when he got into sideways with Gorilla Monsoon. Remember, Sid Vicious was pulling Hulk Hogan out or holding onto his arm when Ric Flair dumped him into the, or dumped him to the floor in the Royal Rumble. So technically, yes. Sid would have been helping, and he was already eliminated. But he didn't do it. All right, I'm picking it, Nitz. We're going at the rules of the Royal Rumble. I like this. Number twelve. Here comes the Kaiser. Number thirteen was Austin Theory. Number fourteen was Finn Balor, who dumped Carmelo for whatever reason. And finally, at number 15, Cody, and the music plays, and the people come up, and he go, does get his pyro at his entrance, and he hits the ring, and he's got big moves set up with people. And he hits the moves, and then he fires the people up, and he dumps Theory, eliminates him, and he throws his weight belt out. He gets in a fight with Dominic and Finn. That was an impactful entrance from a star, and he had shit lined up to do. And I have to think that either whoever's producing the thing are told people who shouldn't make any goddamn impact whatsoever, and also some of these guys are apparently either not smart enough to go to whoever's going to be in the match and say, hey, when I come in, can I bing, bing, and boom, boom? Okay. Because they just wander in and look for somebody to fucking punch. But anyway... We got 90 seconds or two minutes or whatever it was of Cody. And then number 16 is Bronson Reed. And everybody can resume their nap. And Reed dumped Andre. And then number 17 was Kofi. But then Cody eliminated Nakamura. So Cody's still on a little string here. And Kofi eliminated Kaiser. And that now we're at least we're getting it's it's starting to get where we see somebody we want to see a little bit more frequently. Number 18 was Gunther, and he same thing. He got in and made a difference. He leveled Kofi and Finn and Dominic with the chops, and then Jay with the chop and Jimmy with the chop, and body slam Bronson Reed, and then got into it with Cody, but Kofi broke that up so we didn't see you know, what the resolution might be, and then Gunther dumped fucking Kofi. And in number 19 is Ivar. Yeah. And then number 20 was Braun Breaker. Tell me that anybody got the, the idea, the picture, the concept of entering the Royal Rumble and making a big comeback and making an impression on everybody better than Braun Breaker did. No, that was great. And the way he hits the ropes, and they brought it up right away, but just he hit the he hit the ring and then hit the ropes with speed and power, and a lot of people started reacting to that. They said he's been clocked at 23 miles an hour when he hits the ropes. And that means he's only got 20 feet to get to that speed. And that's, I had this idea for Matt Morgan when he was the blueprint, but they ought to take him out and 
shoot videos with Braun Breaker like he's a cyborg, like he's the training video of the Russian perfect athlete in the Rocky movie, or clock him with a goddamn radar gun when he, at 200 and whatever pounds, he's doing this four-second, hundred-yard dash, or give him the tackling dummies and measure the poundage of the impact of his shoulder tackles. It, and and illustrate you're building the perfect athlete. That's he can carry it off, and he's got all the fire in the world. He, uh, so he he speared Jimmy Uso. He dropped Finn Balor. He dropped Ivar. He dumped Jimmy Uso, and then Finn, and then <laughs> pressed Gunther over his head. Gunther drops down to his feet and tries to clothesline him or whatever, and he ducked and speared Gunther and got a big pop. And and he wasn't done. There was other shit he was going to do, but he would just, you can see, and the people, obviously many of those, and it's a big major pay-per-view crowd, they watch, you know, NXT also, or they know what's going on, but a lot of other people that got brought up or brought in or even on the main roster didn't get anywhere near this response. They know he's something to watch out for. And he's got to stay up on the main roster now at this point. It has to be soon, doesn't it? It's been a few years now. And that's, I mean, it's usually a good sign that you're going to get introduced when you make the rumble. But anyway, then we're back to reality. Number 21 almost is back. All seven feet, three of him. And his size 32 fucking feet. And MVP was alongside. I thought MVP would be on a cruise this time of year. I do not believe he was uh, booked for a cruise. He had the Royal Rumble, a bigger booking. To he was, he was maybe he wasn't in, invited this year because he's he's been there and done that, knocked that out. But um, maybe so. So almost came in with choke slams and dumped Bronson Reed, and then Braun Breaker speared and dumped Ivar, and then number twenty two is up. And it's Pat McAfee. He's doing commentary. And they did this with Lawler one year. And it was it was actually a little bit more extensive. But he got up from his desk, took off his jacket. He gets in the ring. He sees Braun Breaker and almost standing there. And turns around and climbs back over the top rope and eliminates himself. And then Braun immediately dumps almost. So you got the comedy spot which i didn't really care for it was better with lawler because he was he actually wrestled predominantly and also it was a little more entertaining but you get braun breaker to get the opportunity to dump the biggest guy in the match and then dominic the the little heat getter comes from behind and dumps braun while he was busy with almost which gives braun breaker a, a graceful way out that he got screwed on. And then immediately they play JD Funko's music and he's coming, he's part of Dominic's group. So as he's coming down to the ring, Braun Breaker comes around the side and spear JD Funko in the next week on the floor and said, how about your boy now? And left and there's JD laying there. So Braun Breaker came out of this i think the best of of pretty much anybody i thought the pat mcafee spot was so stupid i didn't like it at all there was something that they could have done with it but it was too, it, it was too slow and it wasn't the concept is it would have been entertaining if they'd have done something to you know lawler when he was a heel i mentioned they did this with him before i can't remember what he did when he got in the rumble but when he was a he heel, got eliminated he, right away well but i can't remember exactly how it was done but in in Tennessee, when he was a heel, he used to have a spot where he would get up on the apron of the ring, this big cocky grin on his face, grab the top rope, vault over the top rope, and as soon as both of his feet hit the mat, the baby face would be there with an uppercut under his chin, and he would go straight up and take a backwards bump over the top rope that he had just come over on the other side of the buckle and to the floor. And if McAfee could have pulled something like that off, it would have got a big pop. And they're, oh! But instead, he gets in, he stares at him forever. They don't move at him. He shows he's intimidated. He crawls back over. 
he almost he gets his nerve back and gets back in like and then he crawls back over again and eh. too long not enough didn't work even the fans that reacted to McAfee coming out they didn't really seem to react to the spot yeah. I think because it was also telegraphed you knew what it was also the almost Braun Breaker moment was pretty cool but the entrance music of JD almost ruined it because people started counting down to see who the next person was not yeah. knowing who it is right when they're having the moment where he gets eliminated. I agree. I agree. And that comes from, I don't know if they were trying to, if they were perfect, cause I didn't watch the clock every second, but in the, in the pioneer days of the rumble, they would stretch a few minutes or a few minutes. They'd stretch a few seconds. If what it was supposed to happen had not happened yet, but they may have been keeping this legit. So I don't know what the, but it did step on, each other somewhat but we had time to rest and think about it because here came our truth now hold on was he i gotta go back and see what spot this is number 24 in the women's yes number 24 so at least they got that right he came out number 24 in both you know i didn't even pay attention to that that's good consistency at least they got yes. that going yeah i <laughs> see i got the notes here so so our truth comes down to ringside and throws JD in, who's still laying there from being speared by Braun Breaker, and is and JD immediately stands up, and Jay Uso is there to clothesline him out over the top rope. So that's kind of, and that did get a bit of a pop because it was, it was so quick and slick and smooth, where he's he rolls in, stands up, clotheslined out again. So his time was officially, I guess, one second in the ring. And that was, but then our truth gets up to the apron, and as Gunther has a hold on Dominic, he's our truth is milking the tag like, "Come tag me, Dom," and the announcers are making, they, and that got a big reaction. Yes, they're, 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 they, <laughs> the fans reacted more to that than in a tag match when they're milking the fucking tag, because it is preposterous. And now at this point, I think the fans are just going along with the parody. And obviously, our truth has been a wrestler for 20 years. He doesn't really think. But Dominic gets away from Gunther and hits a hot tag on our truth, and our truth makes a comeback. So we had a hot tag in the Royal Rumble. I think Pat Patterson actually may have got a tickle out of that. And then number 25 was The Miz, and he and our truth did some comedy that I didn't particularly understand or pay attention to. And then number 26 was Damian Priest, who got in and leveled R-Truth and dumped him. But they ain't reacting to Priest like he's made it to the level yet, are there? At least they didn't hear. No, and that's why it's a good move for him to do that to R-Truth, because it would get him heat right away. Yeah, but I'm, I think all of this, there's so much going on in the Judgment Day, they're losing focus on any one person in it, except maybe Rhea, who's bulletproof at this point. They're losing focus on the seriousness, because now we're yes. getting the backstage drama discussions, where everyone kind of loses their promo voice and talks with concern. Yes. It doesn't really make you interested in someone. I don't know if I want to see the villain in the movie be overly concerned about things. But nevertheless... At number 27, like Mussolini! Here he came. Your voice, ugh. Here he came. Horrible. CM Punk comes out, and now, uh, now they know we're going home, thankfully, finally. Now they know we're getting into the meat of the matter, as Jim Ross would say, nut-cutting time. We're at number 27. We only got three more to go. Cody's in there. Punk is in there. He makes a big comeback on everybody, gets a big pop, pulls his shirt off. He's gained weight and tan somewhat. Chuck Dominic over the top rope to eliminate the, the most disliked person in the match. And then Priest dropped him so that his flurry was over with so we could get Ricochet to come on down. And... As Ricochet came in and did his thing, then Gunther dumped Miz. But again, Punk came in. He looks like he's aging in reverse now. He's not 
not got stress. He's not got worry. His hair is getting darker. His skin is getting tanner and he's gaining his weight back. Was it, was it all just the, the fucking mental duress of working with children that was aging him before his time? Maybe it's the money. Well, he was making money before. That's true. He's been making money both places. He just, he's got more motivation. There's, there's something to actually be accomplished at this point instead of just treading water until you get out of your deal because nobody else can contribute. And maybe he's actually at a good place in his life and he was a few years ago and that's why the drama affected him so much. And now he's in a place where there's not going to be any of that drama. They're not going to put up on any of that shit. <sighs> Well, anyway, but nevertheless, number 29 was Drew McIntyre, who beat everybody up and then got in a fight with Damian Priest to no reaction, which was a telling thing about Priest. Uh, and then Gunther dumped Jey Uso. And number 30 was Sami Zayn. And he went right after Drew because that's who put him out before. But Drew flipped Ricochet out. A lot of people hit moves on everybody. Sammy dumped Priest and Drew dumped Sammy. And then we got down to the meat of the matter. Rhodes and Punk and McIntyre and Gunther. And there were two heels and two baby faces, so the heels got heat on the baby faces for a while. And at that point, I was like, you know, this... This I would really be interested in this more if I hadn't had to wait almost an hour to get here. Right? That was the thought I had. But they were doing good shit. And then Drew hit a kick on Gunther by mistake, but he kicked Cody on purpose. And then he hit the kick on Punk. And he told Punk, I'm not the same kid that I was 10 years ago. And then Punk stood right up underneath him. Fireman's carried him and dumped him right over the top rope. Oh, that was a little... A little abrupt, wasn't it? Did you expect that? No. And neither did Drew, based on the reaction Man, on yeah. the floor. He was completely surprised. And then Gunther hit a kick and a powerbomb on Punk, but set Cody on the top rope and was going to push him out, but Cody pulled Gunther over and out and got a big pop for that. So now there we go. It's Cody and Punk. And they actually had a bit more of a match, and each one of them did their shit. And now we see this is where people were interested, and we also see that, you know, they're doing pretty good shit. They, you know, they set it up where they did back and forth. Punk foiled the cutter and hit three Germans. His knee lift and bulldog, but Cody foiled the GTS, hit the flip flop and fly. Punk foils the crossroads. Goes to dump Cody. Cody foils that. A lot of foiling. Cody blocked the, the GTS and hit the crossroads again, but Punk was dead weight until he was playing possum, and then he hit the GTS. But then Punk had to go for one more, but Cody landed on his feet, spun around, and threw Punk out. Big pop and music and... Cody gets the first back-to-back -back win successive years since Austin 25 years ago. Did you hear what Punk said? What did he say? I think the exact words were, I'm not going to lose to Dusty's kid. And then Cody eliminated Ah! I heard, I heard the announcers say something about that, but I did not pick up on it because I was jotting down what had previously happened. Yeah, no, Punk looked right at the camera and said it. And then he got eliminated. So you have to think that plays a big part in the story now because that's, again, an interesting thing after the Drew moment for Punk to make a statement like that, which telegraphed to me that he was about to lose, which is the only bad thing yeah. about it. Well, and then, then now Punk has to say, I shouldn't have opened my big mouth. So there you go. All right, that'll maybe be the promo he does. <laughs> I should, Cody, I shouldn't have opened my big mouth. I'm asking my for a do-over. Big mouth. I got it like Ralph Cremden. I got a big mouth, Alice. But yeah, so I do, uh, Ralph. But now we've got, see, this again raises questions. Are we going to get Cody and Roman? In that case, are we going to get Rock and Roman? 
Are we going to get rock and wrestling with our rock and Roman? There's Elimination Chamber coming up in Australia. We'll discuss what time of day we're going to watch that event. Oh, good Lord. But that's coming up, and that usually has some sort of repercussion towards WrestleMania. We said the other day an option is to have Rock as the referee to get him involved, but not have him beat Roman yet. But who knows what they're going to do? They certainly made it that, I mean, Cody said it at the press conference afterwards. He's challenging Roman. Oh, yeah. So the question is now, how do we get from here to there? And well, and and they had Seth and Roman both in skyboxes watching, but you know it, it's clear that it, uh, Punk and Seth had had words, so you would think that that would lean that way. But Cody wants Roman; he's made that statement. But the fact that Punk made that comment before he was eliminated sets up issues with him and Cody. Yes. The question becomes: Does Punk do something to cost Cody that match? Ooh, that would reveal some true colors, wouldn't it? Does Punk turn more heelish? Because again, the comment wasn't a babyface comment. Because Cody's the top babyface. Yeah. So what does that say? What are they going to do with that? What it says is we still need to see Cody Rhodes and CM Punk, and that ain't happened yet. But it's gonna. It's gonna. But in the but, meantime, uh, Cody wins, and he gets to be in the main event. They don't even say anymore you get to choose who you wrestle. It's just you get to be in the main event of WrestleMania. Yeah. <laughs> well, they mention you can choose whatever title holder that you want to challenge, but at the same time, even more important than the than the championship match or the opportunity is just to main event WrestleMania. That's the big thing. That's more important than the world title. That's where they're going with that. All right, well, actually, we're not completely done with Rumble news yet or Rumble reporting at this point, but I've got a. We took a break just real quick so that one of us who has older kidneys could relieve themselves, but as we were starting to start again, I asked you the question, Brian, last, if there had ever been a superhero in the history of superheroes the, whose only power was super hearing and because you've got it and we were trying to figure that out and i've mentioned something and you asked me a question that i was astonished to hear you ask did you or did you not ask me does superman have super hearing i, I did well hold on you're saying it out of context though i also want to go back to the fact that you said i have this superpower if that's true if what you're saying is indeed true I do not concede that's my only superpower. I have all sorts of super senses. Oh, I don't need glasses and I can read small things hey. and big things, far things and near things. Small things and big things, far things and near. Well, thank right. you, Brian Seuss. But the, <laughs> I know you haven't got super smell because there's a couple of stinkers you haven't sn sniffed out. Hey. But uh, I mean, we've been involved in most of them. That's right. But uh, uh, <laughs> the point is, no, Superman, but he has a plethora of superpowers. Yes, he does. You, yes, you he are, does. You are not, I, I knew Superman, and you were not Superman. What I was saying was this. You said only superpower, first of all. Yes. Superman has many superpowers. I refuse to acknowledge that you have any other superpowers besides this one well, that you have demonstrated well, let's which get off. Turn, may turn out to be goddamn a, a sm slight brain tumor on your non compass mentis. Well, let's get off me and let's get on Krypton's favorite son. What I'm saying is, what I asked you is, do you have any specific examples you can cite of Superman displaying his super hearing? Yes, yeah, so he would do it all the time. Give me an example. Well, I don't know. He'd hear through the wall that the fucking bomb was ticking. I can't. Your Honor, Your Honor, I'm asking Superman to strike, issue. I'll strike everything. It. Strike everything I, this guy's saying, Your Honor. I do not have time to go through a box of Superman comic books to fucking find an instance of his super hearing, uh, just the same as I don't uh, his supervision or his not supervise where he would be supervising. <laughs> super, <laughs> supervision. <laughs> <laughs> or his his goddamn super strength is apparent on numerous covers of magazines and publications, but the various other the, the X ray vision is what it is. There's never one where he's like listening into a door. Like, what are they saying in there? Like, there's no covers like that, are there? 
Well, it's hard to draw that in a still frame. There, there's certainly uh, instances of that in the television show. Which, the, the George Reeves television show? Yeah, yeah, but well, but I guess if his hearing, hearing had been that good, he would have heard who was sneaking up on him. When, you, any, when you were a kid, how did you hear that he died? Did you hear the real story or any of the urban myths? Um, well, that he was, that he thought he, he was really Superman. He tried to fly and he died. Hold on now. Hold on now, cowboy. Because you're making me older than I really am. What year did he die? Because he died before that I was born. Did he not? He did, but that show was in reruns. It was the only well, yes, televised Superman point, for years. By the, by the time that I saw it, which was up at Aunt Lola's on Cincinnati's finest independent station, uh, channel 19. WXIX, um, I was nine years old, probably, and then I was already starting to get into comic books, I already had, and was getting fanzine publications, and had read that it was a myth that, uh, that he, you know, was trying to demonstrate that he could fly, or whatever the fuck, or that some kid shot him because he wanted to watch the bullet bounce off of him or whatever. That was all. I already knew that that was bullshit at the same time as I knew that he had been shot. Don't you see? But you remember examples on that show where Superman or Clark Kent demonstrated their super hearing. That's what I'm asking you. Yes, yes. As plain as day. As plain as the nose plain on your day. face. What about yes. in book form, in comic book form? Well, I, I'm sure it happened, and I'm You're sure, sure. That, I'm sure, and and many of the cult of Cornet members are going to send John Fell. I know is going to hop right on this and make you look like a fool, boy. I didn't say anything other than ask questions. I'm like Jesse Ventura. I'm only asking questions. Well, you're you're I trying to, to doubt. Truth. You're trying to doubt my word, and I'm I'm an elderly person to you. <laughs> You're disrespecting your elderly. <laughs> to me, you're an elderly person. Yes. <laughs> All right. All righty then. But you asked if they would, but that Superman had many superpowers. To go back to your question, you asked about yes. someone who only had the superpower of super hearing. Yes. That would be you. Thanks. So now we've come full circle. And you're not sniffing out any of these stinkers. All right, should we go on to this audio that we were going to talk about? Apparently they... They felt it was a good idea to have a press conference uh, after the Royal Rumble, and I, 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 I why do they ha are they contractually obligated to who in that room wanted to go out and face the press and as answer questions? And is this real press in the not like Tony's friends, but like actual real people that are going to ask questions? or at least follow up on the questions, or whatever the case. The reality is there are real... When you say real press, let's speak specifically about the wrestling press, if you want to call it that. They're asking real questions. They're trying to get some accountability. They're trying to get some answers. They're out there. They're also the members of the same press asking about, like, what did 14-year-old you think of what you booked tonight, or whatever the fuck. I don't think anybody better be asking any questions about 14-year-olds but as But as you'll hear here, I mean, and we hear so many of the AEW media scrums here at the Royal Rumble post-show press conference, they let people in that were going to ask questions, and since this time, some of the people who asked these questions have come out and said they did not vet my question. They treated me like a serious journalist. They did not tell me what I could not ask. So, it's... Then, for a company that's... For a company that's always done the opposite, it's certainly a different way of doing things. We could say that. Okay, but then why am I hearing that everybody's answers was bullshit? Or just, bleh? Because it seems like that would be the one question. I know you've got the audio. We'll play a little bit of it. I haven't heard it. I've heard the general consensus of people is that's the best he could say. And so... Didn't they know that these people were going to have to ask about the thing that everybody in the world was heads were on fire about? And why didn't they either prepare proper answers or potentially not have poor Triple H out there at all to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune? 
We'll find out if they fire their press guy this week. Yeah, see what his continued track of employment is. But anyway, you take over from here. You got the audio. Yeah, and again, we'll talk a little bit more about Triple H in a moment, but we want to play some audio for it. We here over at, uh, at the studio, we want to play some audio first <laughs> of Cody Rhodes, who had a big night. He won the Royal Rumble. Here's a couple of questions of Cody Rhodes. First, he asked about what kind of media was in the room. Here's a question. We'll see what you think of this. Well, our first question comes from someone who knows you very well and vice oh, versa. No. WWE Hall of Famer, a- Diamond Dallas Page. <laughs> I Diamond. just was in the hall with him going, do you want to go to the presser? <laughs> I was so damn proud of him. I climbed through all the people and over the rail and to hug him because I have been a Cody Rhodes fan since his very first state championship title. His second straight and I believed in him when a lot of people didn't believe in him, but I know he believed in him. And it was a guy who believed in both of us called the American Dream, Dusty Rhodes. And to do this here in the St. Pete, Tampa area, mm. Dusty Rhodes country, dude, what does that feel like? Have you, have you absorbed yeah. it yet? Um, earlier today, I saw Steve Kern and uh and gerald briscoe and i i went and said hello but i saw dory funk i wanted to hide because it sounds silly uh i can't think about him because the fight isn't really for him he had his fight if you could ask him he was as happy as could be with what he what he accomplished but the fight now is for my wife uh my daughter my mom so I don't think about Dusty, even though, you know, I can't not think about him. I think about them and uh, to see them in the front row. And, you know, I never tell them anything that's happening. So they're always just the best possible thing to ever is to see my mom and her know I, I'm doing all right. <laughs> sorry, guys. Sorry. Um, but yeah, that's it's very exciting to be here and do it. And uh, when I go to sleep tonight and hopefully dream of uh, the man himself. I can tell him. Drew a pretty big house in St. Pete and uh, was on last. Hit my finish. That's all that ever mattered to him. So it'd be a great moment. Thank you, D. Well, let's stop it there for a moment. What would you think of that? Oh, that was that was cool. I'm glad that apparently maybe Paige was just wandering by. That sounded kind of impromptu. And uh, that was, you could tell that it means a lot to Cody because who would have thought from three years ago or whatever that he actually was, he, you know, he won the main event of the second biggest pay-per-view of the year for the biggest company of the year to get the chance at the title to finish the story, the blah, 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 in Tampa, St. Petersburg with, you know, his, Dusty's cohorts and, you know, his generation of talent watching etc that had to be emotional so that was that was pretty cool and that's the thing yeah we drew a hell of a house i was on the main event hit my finish you know that's uh that's dusty and seeing cody in moments like this really makes you like him and triple h said later on i don't know if we have uh, the audio bite for this but he said that cody's the guy he's the guy they have to drag back in because he won't stop signing autographs and stuff Yeah. You know, it's nice moments like this, but it's also how you handle big questions. Let's go now to Cody Rhodes getting a question about everything that's been happening the last few days. Next question. I almost pointed. You're in the front row. Hi, Cody. Nick Hausman, House of Wrestling. Well, you always introduce yourself like I don't know you. I'm not. <laughs> it's not for us, right? It's I, for the it's, overall. It, I got it. I'm not, I'm not special, Cody. Nick Hausman, everybody. Thank you, Cody. Um, there was a real dark cloud over this weekend. Yeah following the allegations against Vince McMahon. Mm -hmm. Um, You've talked about how Vince met with you personally to bring you into the company. Uh, I just wanted to get your reaction to the report. And as someone who served as an executive within the industry, what changes do you think should be made across the board to prevent situations like this from happening again? Let me stop there. Great question. Wow. Nick Houseman. 
You see, when you say, do they ask real questions? There are guys that are a part of the wrestling press that ask real questions. And they're ones who want to know the favorite color of the wrestler. <laughs> you know, you got tiger beat in the same room as, uh, you know, the serious people asking serious questions. But, but now the, the, here's the question to paraphrase Jerry Seinfeld. It's not the asking of the question. It's the answering of the question. How was Cody's answer? Well, let me ask you before we get to that, if you're a talent and you're doing something like this, and I know this is not something you ever did. It wasn't, you know, great job in the Superdome tonight. Get out there for the media scrum. Yeah. But you have to expect this question. You have to expect that you're going to have to say something. How well prepared are you going in? What are you thinking going in if it was you? Well, if I'm a talent... It's an unfair position then, in a sense because, you know, Cody no, is just no, a talent. It, because that's a thing. If you're a talent, then you can fairly well answer the question honestly and at the same time not cause controversy. If, if Cody, there was two parts of it. What do you think? And also, what would you do as a former executive? He gave, what would I think is, yes, I met with Vince McMahon and I worked at the company for several years previously. And... I was as astonished as anyone to hear of behavior like this in a complaint. I say, you know, let the situation play out in court, but I never saw any side of Vince McMahon like this. Because I think that would be a pretty honest answer for Cody. And with the, as a former, ex hold on, and both, and I'll answer both of you guys. And as a former executive, he could, the question, he could say, you know, quite honestly, since there is a new administration here and new owners and the TKO Holdings Group and et cetera, that's probably the answer right there is that a new administration with a stricter uh, supervision and oversight, and we luckily already have that in progress. And Do you think a talent would get in trouble if they came out and said, you know... I'm disgusted by this. I hope we never see him again. Hope he rots in hell. <laughs> Go fuck yourself, Vince. Would someone get in trouble right now for doing that? Um, I think they would almost have to get in trouble, not, not because, maybe even from somebody who might echo the same sentiment, but it's not the talent's place to say that because the, can you imagine the fucking headlines and blah, 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 and they don't want... That's the last thing they want. Open those floodgates. The next person comes in. I want to say, go fuck yourself too. Yeah. And then, you know, or whoever, well, he, so-and-so's fired. Well, I never liked him. Anyway. It, you know, yeah. I would think that even if whoever was disciplining the talent agreed, you know, with the sentiment, they would have to say, no, you can't fucking do that. But, well, again, but let's, anyway. Yeah, let's go to this. If you're going to be a top guy, you got to be able to answer these kind of questions or at least get through it. Let's see how Cody Rhodes does. It's a great question. I know as far as the news is concerned, um, we were finding it out and reading the same things that you guys were reading. And you said a dark cloud, certainly. As far as uh, TKO, Nick Khan and the board clearly took it very seriously, uh, acted immediately. And um, looking at the future, you know, I don't know the answer to that. And I think somewhere is a really probably a basic tenet of just this crew, more than ever from a roster standpoint, is very family never seen anything like this. Most of the time, wrestling locker rooms are fighting, talking trash about each other, making fun of each <laughs> other, sandbagging each other in the ring, all that nonsense. This, this crew is very team-based, and perhaps that's the ingredient, is everyone looking out for everyone, being accountable. Um, and I know for me as a you know, performer and a competitor, I've been through dark periods in our industry before, and it might sound cheesy, but it's very reinforcing if you're in my position that it's a time when, hey, we got 50,000 people out here. I want to give them something else from this weekend that isn't a terrible situation and terrible news. And I think we were able to do that. And obviously, as more news comes out, we'll be seeing it just like you do. Thank you. How do you think he handled that? Excellent. 
Uh, you know, he he sounded sincere, genuine. He didn't say anything that could be ripped off as a inflammatory headline. Cody Rhodes says this or that, and he was at the same time as honest as he could be. Uh, so yeah, you know, and that Cody is glib. Cody is eloquent. Cody is verbose, and that's why he was the adult in the group of the EVPs over there, actually doing business. Well, that was Cody Rhodes' answer to that question. What a lot of people are talking about is Triple H's answer. And he was asked a few times. We'll play the audio in a moment. Now, Tony Khan recently experienced something like this because of the rumors swirling around Chris Jericho and the non-answers being given. Really, it started that night with the non-answers. He was asked several times in between Tiger Beat questions <laughs> about it. and one time dressed in a funny manner, but he didn't answer anything, didn't say anything, didn't shut it down. So now let's look at Triple H having to answer, because he has to know, like we said before, well, yeah, Cody Rhodes, yeah. he has to know he's going to be asked about this. And see, the thing is, Cody, as we said, also didn't have the responsibility as a just a talent, not an office employee or whatever, of giving the sort of official company response, this would fall on Triple H if he's going to be out there. Certainly there would have been mass cramming and preparing, one would think, for exactly the right thing to say. Well, Jim, let's go to the first question of Triple H about this right now. Hey, Paul, right here. Uh, John Alba, Fightful. Uh, speaking of the business side of things, uh, it was about a year ago the WWE Board of Directors unanimously opposed Vince's return to the company as executive chair uh, due to the ongoing investigations at the time before ultimately voting him back into power. You, Stephanie, Nick Khan, you were part of that. Uh, what degree of knowledge of the current accusations against him did you guys have at the time, and how does the situation affect WWE's relationship with partners going forward? Let me stop right there. How about that for a question? Boom! Um, the, as I was hearing that, if I was thinking if it was me about the only defense that I might even have was, well, I didn't know some of the details, <laughs> but let's see what he said. What, what, what? I'll say what I was going to say for after we play the audio. Let's play the answer to this question. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to do exactly what you would expect me to do here. Um, Look, we just had an amazing week. I just said a 10-year, $5 billion Netflix deal. Rock joining our board. We just sold out the Royal Rumble, put 48,000 people in the Tropicana Field. Um, I choose to, to focus on the positive. And yes, there's a negative, um, but uh, I, I want to focus on that and just keep it to that. Oh, that's the end of that. Very reminiscent of Mark oh. McGuire when he was questioned about steroids and he said he just wanted to look at the positives of that era, not the positive tests, but you yeah, know, the positives yeah. of that era. Triple H, again, had to know this was coming, had to know he would have to say something at some point, because if it wasn't brought up, it would be the biggest indictment of this press conference ever. How do you think he did there? Shh, no, 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 that ain't it, bro, as they say. I think almost if he was going to be out there, not only as a corporate executive with the company, but as a member of the family, if he was going to be out there at all, then couldn't he have fielded the first Vince-related question with, look, guys, obviously this is a, a, a touchy and stressful and sensitive subject for me, not only business-wise, but personally. And I am... As shocked as anyone here in this room to hear some of the things that have been alleged, but I can't comment on things that have been reported in this complaint, both as a member of the family who, even though I've apparently... <laughs> You know, uh, learning things about my father-in-law, he's innocent until proven guilty. And at the same time, it's not the same company that put on this production that drew 50,000 people here tonight as it was 
you know, a few years ago when these things were alleged to take place. So leave me alone. Would that would that have been something? You know, we said it about Tony Khan. He could have shut down everything right away. If Triple H had come out here, and again, we don't know what he personally feels. And the other thing we have to remember, we don't know if he has any liability here. We don't know if he's one of the unnamed executives. We don't know anything about what he truly knew when he truly knew it. We know that his wife may have known things. And again, it's his wife. They live together. It's not a well, Vince and Linda situation. But also, he did have, and nobody's saying that it wasn't legitimate, he had a heart issue. In what year was it? Was that? Yeah, right when he found out about this. Well, I mean, <laughs> we don't know what triggered it. But what, wasn't that the pandemic year? Uh, or was it the year? So the point at, at, at some point, he was not around for an extensive period of time. And then over the past, what, year, year and a half, he and Stephanie have been trying to dodge Vince whenever possible and voting against him returning to the board. If anything was said reflecting that, I think it would have gone a long way. Somebody is going to do a timeline on what executives came and went uh, against this complaint or allegation in the lawsuit and what, where certain key people were in relation to their yeah. involvement with the WWE. And when maybe did that, that George might... Barrios leave? Yes, and Michelle Wilson. Yeah. They, well, leave. I didn't Vince say see ya? Huh. Um, so, you know, all the comings and goings, talent, biz, office executives, whatever, c compared to the... That would be it. Maybe Thurston Howell the Third can do that on WrestleNomics. It'd be more interesting than the AEW ratings. Well, we'll see. But again, Triple H could have just come out and said, I can't say too much, obviously, due to my role in the company. I don't even think you bring up the family thing because no one's sympathetic to that right now. I don't think. Well, I think I think wouldn't uh, weren't you sympathetic to fucking Jeffrey Dahmer's mother, who had the goddamn news media or whatever on her fucking front porch, or in any case where is like, yeah, your son, we found six heads in his freezer. Well, please leave me alone. I haven't talked to him in five years. He's whatever. the son-in-law. He's not the mother. It's a little different. Well, yeah, I'm just saying. It's like, what's he supposed to say, right? Well, that's the thing. If he had permission from up above, and you have to think anything he said here was cleared one way or another from legal of that company. It may not be WWE, but I got to believe they're doing that the way WWE would have. If he came out there and said, I can't say too much, but let me just say Vince McMahon is not coming back. That's a good thing. We're horrified like everyone else. And unfortunately... That's the amount of what I could say right now. Because again, we don't know, we don't know who knew what, and we don't know who the unnamed people are. So there's a lot going on that we still don't have details on, and we don't know if he's tied into that. But I think he need. I think something could have been said to shut this down, and it wasn't. Yeah, and 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 to clarify, since everybody's so touchy these days, clarify what you just said. We don't mean. Triple H into it as far as participating in any of the activities. We're no, talking about what no. level of knowledge did he have of what, to what level of extent of things was going on. Right, because if anything ever happened with talent, and it was reported through talent relations, God forbid when John Laurinaitis was in charge. Gee. But if it was reported through talent relations when Triple H was in charge, we don't know who has knowledge of what. And I'm not justifying that. I mean, I would like full accountability immediately. And if Triple H was knowledgeable about all this and turned a blind eye, that needs to be called out right away. But we don't know that. So that was the first question. Let's go to the next question about this. Right away after that one. All the way in the uh, back. Hi there, Honor. Uh, Cameron Hawkins from The Ringer. Um, just a question that was asked earlier to Cody. I wanted to get your thoughts on it. Just what's being put in place just to make sure that employees feel safe, they don't feel like they're taken advantage of, just what is being done to make sure that um, people in positions of power can't take advantage of employees under them? I'll give you that. Once again, let's hear it for the wrestling media. What's going <laughs> on? All right. Yay. The most generalized answer that I can. Everything possible. Yeah. It's a, that that is a, a very important thing to us, a very important topic to us. 
It's as simple as everything possible. Our final question, we'll head to the... Well, let me stop it before that final question that's being said there. It's a very Vince answer, isn't it? Yes, yes. And again, second guessing, but I would have had to think that you could say, look, this is... For one thing, we have new ownership and new people in place at the top and a new line of who we report to or corporate structure or however that's phrased these days and new accountabilities. And I would venture to say that not only will it not, could it not happen, it is almost impossible for something like that to happen in with the current structure of this brand new company in place with all these fucking professional Nuck, muckety mucks. I mean, you know, you you see what I'm saying? That line with all the experience that these people have running this massive corporation now, why there's, we feel that stronger than ever before, everyone can feel comfortable and safe and this is handled in the most responsible of manners. Blah, 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 blah. Anything. It was almost like he was scared to say anything. But I didn't, I really just didn't say anything, did I? Specifically, no, you may be more comfortable with words than Triple H is like in what? moments like this. Loud noises. <laughs> well, let's go to this. Uh, what is being said to be the final question? The right hand corner. Hi, uh, Brandon Thurston from WrestleNomics. Uh, Thurston. Just wanted- Sorry, it, I know you have a microphone, but they are moving a bunch of stuff, and it's really hard for me to just a little bit louder, please. Brandon Thurston from WrestleNomics. Yes. Uh, did you read the lawsuit that came out this week? And if you did, what was your reaction to it? I did not. I did not. Um, I think Cody mentioned it, that we all found out in real time when you were. Um, and that's the truth. Um, I'll, I'll go back to what I said before. It, this, this is an amazing week for us. And uh. I just, at this point, I, I don't even want to get bogged down in the negatives of it. I just want to focus on the positives and where we're going. And we're at the most exciting time of the year for us we're at the most exciting point to me business wise i think that we've ever had i think cody might have said the 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 i don't exactly remember how he said it but the best positioning of this company since the attitude era i've been through that era i understand what it's like i feel like we are in the middle of something that while we might not be able to put our finger on it right now Five, ten years from now, we're going to be saying, like, wow, what a time that was. Um, I, want to, I want to focus on that. What do you think of that answer? Oh, well, for one thing, yes, he may have really have found out in real time, 48 hours before they're sitting there, right? But it, I read that 70 pages in less than 67 in less than 48 hours. You can't tell me that he didn't read it with that Wall Street Journal article and everything, blah, 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 most people are not going to believe that. Wouldn't you say that's a fair assessment and most people would not believe that he wasn't going to read that thing? And it, it, Not if he's an executive, not if he's a member of the family, not if he was involved. I mean, there's no way he's not aware of what's happening there. So the point is, I th- at that point, you have to say something like, look, you're asking me, to comment on pending civil litigation against my company at a press conference and my family at a press. And all I can say on a personal basis is that the person described in this complaint is not the human being that I have come to know, but as this, they may not want to say that they may want to stay, they staying away from saying anything. But no, but, but here's the thing. You could say that truthfully, because if, if, if you can't say that out loud and kind of mean it, then you're really fucked anyway. Because people will go, see, you knew he was a goddamn fucking horrible human being and Satan, whatever. With the guy's son-in-law say, to get any off of, this is not the human being that I've come to know, but as this plays out, we will, obviously, I'm, you know, sure the true facts will come to light, whatever they may be, but see, I'm not going to try it in public opinion. It, it would have made it worse if he said this is not the human. Anything that sympathizes Vince at all in any way would kill him. He has to come and kill. He has to come and say what everyone thinks of Vince right now if he's truly disgusted about it like everyone else is. If he says 
this is not the human being. I know, first of all, that opens him up. If there's any stories from anyone ever over the last 30 years that he's been there. Well, okay, yeah, you're right. If this was anything. the human being he knew, but... Yeah, and we don't know how dirty and perverted Vince has always been. And what he keeps from some people, you know, he didn't marry you into the family. You know, he keeps, <laughs> he keeps some things from some people, and we don't know what he keeps from others, but we know there are a lot of people that have spent a whole lot of fucking time around him for the last 20 years, so we don't know who knew what. Well, then in that case, if I'd have been Triple H there, I'd have just said, I can't fucking comment on ongoing civil litigation against my company in press conference, guys. So, you know, again, you know, we'll see what happens. I think it's time for a new podcast where we do wrestling mock trials and we could each like do a Perry Mason thing where we, <laughs> one of us is the defense and the other one is the you know, which, <laughs> Do I have to be Hamilton Berger? Well, since you volunteered. Oh, for God's sake. But, um, but yeah, I don't, they, somebody, some glib Nick Khan type or Ari Emanuel or whoever these people are that make these silver tongue deals should have tried to give him a, a paragraph or something. Well, no one's just leaving him sitting out there fending for himself. Let's get back to that in a moment. Just to tie things up with Triple H here, he's getting a lot of, blowback a lot of people complaining about what he said here or what he didn't say a lot of people really giving it to him do you think it's well deserved what what are your thoughts coming out of this a, a yes because that's the thing he both you you know that he can't say many things but he didn't say anything and the stuff that he did say made it sound like he was avoiding saying any more things you see that's what the thing is to me it <laughs> Cody sounded more like the representative of the company, and Triple H sounded like the guy on the talent roster that didn't really know what to fucking say. I'd rather not talk about the rape. Let's talk about the house. Like, that's not a good answer. Yeah. That's not a good answer. But again, I don't know what exactly he could say or what he would say, but we don't know what he can say because we don't know who's tied up into what with all of this, but I, th I think even, even a smoother, you know, on any of the questions, guys, I cannot, I'm, you know, just pro prohibited from speaking about ongoing litigation of, of, against my company. I, as a person, we are all shocked and horrified at these allegations and hope that the truth comes to light. What the fuck? How can you know? Can you get that out? Do you think the company is going to be in trouble? Because obviously there was an investigation. There were stories going around. Vince was ousted and he came back specifically to facilitate this purchase of the company where he would serve as executive chairman. Well, but if you, if you buy something legally from an asshole and a criminal that you intend to run fairly and above board and honestly, I don't even know don't, what the end of that yeah. question is. Otherwise, then should you not be able to get a thing to <laughs> to use its powers for good because the guy you're buying it from is a fucking subhuman cretin? If a subhuman cretin has a great asset to sell, maybe you buy it, but you probably don't put him as the head of the board of directors, the executive chairman of the board of directors. Uh, but was that... Was that the deal? Was that the only way they could get it? Was that, and it, it, then we know that, you know, Vince was demoted or made ceremonial or whatever the phrase was they used the other day. He didn't, had really no control over anything anymore. He obviously was always going to want ownership of all that stock all that money, basically. But was that also part of the deal? You got to put me somewhere you know, in this uh, corporate structure, uh, even in name only. And is that also why they, they he started converting his his stock to what he could sell so that they could kind of slowly... And he got the rights to his life story. And he got the rights... Uh, they're they're going to slowly divest, right? But maybe this hastened the divesting. Boy, let me ask you this. On the topic of, you know, we'll see what happens at Ari Emanuel and Mark Shapiro and everyone there, Nick Khan. Who knew what, when... And who turned a blind eye? And did you know that Vince, 
Again, we don't know what they knew Vince was doing, so we don't want to make any assumptions here. And and to be honest, Hollywood types, if they were, if their understanding of it was superficial enough that it would be like, oh, he's hired his girlfriend to be an administrative something, you probably wouldn't dig into that. But the level of the and have, is Nick Khan actually in? WWE headquarters every day, or is he still bopping yes. around the world? We have a very robust office. Well, I'm glad you had that quote ready to go there. But but you, the point is, that's what I'm saying is they if they only had a superficial, yeah, you know, Vince puts his girlfriends on the payroll. Probably people in showbiz wouldn't think anything about that, and they would think everything was consensual, even if it was below board or whatever. Uh, but I I can't imagine that. These fucking professional people would would not have prepared more statements and or ways to weasel out of it if they knew the extent of the story that was coming their way. Does that make sense to you? It does make sense to me. And we'll find out. I mean, again, this isn't just this lawsuit and everything happening that we're talking about. There's a grand jury. So there's something much bigger happening. <laughs> he may get indicted any time. Who knows? And we don't even know for what and for who <laughs> and for which case. Did they get his phone? When, did Vince have a cell phone when you were around him? And no, remember we talked about that, I think, a little while ago. Uh, we, right as I left and came to Louisville, they started getting the Blackberries. But before Vince that, had, just a regular it, cell phone. That you could I'm get. well. You know what? Yes, yes. As a matter of fact, he had a, a, a. That was the first couple of years we had small ones that were available, and because uh, when I first the first year I was up there, I had a beeper. We still had beepers back, but uh, you know. Anyway, um, but you know, again, he had a phone in his fucking limousine, right? That was cool too. You know, the old phone in the limousine deal. But he, I mean, he was always, when I was around him, he was either in the limo, which he might be on, you know, either one of the phones, or in the office, he'd be on his office phone, or at the house, his fucking office-type phone at the house, where it had all the lines and hold and blah, 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 big desk job. He had it sitting on his dining room table whenever we'd have a writing meeting. So he was on a phone a bunch, but I never saw him actually make a personal fucking yeah. call. Or a selfie. Like, that wasn't or, even a thing then. Oh, no. Good Lord, no. Well, again, we'll find out who knew what and when, but that was the WWE, or at least parts of the Royal Rumble post-show press conference, and Triple H uh, has a lot to, uh, the company has to figure out what they could say and what he could say, and if he can't say anything, don't put him out there. I think, you know, maybe they ought to, they ought to let Cody do it because Cody can can talk. Cody can sell things. He could sell an igloo to an Eskimo. Well, I guess an Eskimo would need an igloo. He could sell <laughs> ice to fucking people in hell. Well, I guess they'd probably need... What is that old phrase? Well, I tell you, the point is Cody can sell. Sell like he's going to the electric chair, as Ernie the Cat Lad would say. And you know what? It's easy for you to do the selling, too, when you partner up with our friends at Shopify. Because, ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't matter how fabulous and wonderful your products are, the, the things that you make with your own, your own fingers, your own hands, the things that you craft, the things that you have manufactured, the things that you want to make money on to provide food for yourself and your spouse and your children and educate them so they can grow up and be important members of the community and make money so that they can have children of their own that they can pay for. And it's a vicious cycle with paying for the children generation after generation. That's why you got to start early. And Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business, whether it's the embryonic stage or it's the birthing stage or it's the high school and college stage and i mean they'll start you all the way at the squirting stage and they'll be with you every step of the way will shopify because they're people like that they're not going to leave you twisting in the wind like triple h at a press conference no because shopify 
We'll help you turn browsers into buyers. They can help you set this thing up, monitor it, run it. They are the the power behind 10%, Brian, of all the e-commerce in the United States. Did you did you realize that? That's amazing. It's incredible. And we've talked about Shopify magic, where you can whip up captivating content that converts. They Boom, you either snap your fingers or twinkle your nose and blog posts appear and product descriptions and fact answers and all those things. And they can grow your business thanks to an endless list of integrations. They are fully integrated. It's a come one, come all, no matter what your background, race, creed, or national origin. And they've got third-party apps. So... You know, party on, Garth. You can bring party hats and noisemakers for the whole thing. But anyway, right now, Brian, you'll never guess. Because if you're just starting up your store and you need some help with every step of the way, every aspect of the game, you will never guess what minute amount of money that you're going to have to spend to get Shopify on your side. Can you imagine that? Just take a wild guess. $10,000. No, think again. $75. Not even. $40. You are incorrect, sir. You can now <laughs> sign up for a $1 a month trial period at shopify.com slash JCE, all lowercase, by the way, that JCE. You can go out right now and just panhandle. Just go out with a hat or a box or a cup in your hand, try to limp and and maybe and wear, wear some old clothes and just hold it in front of you at any corner, street corner in America. No. And don't in do probably that. 10 minutes or less, you can have the dollar that it will cost you to sign up for this dollar a month trial period at Shopify.com slash J C E. Don't panhandle. We don't advise anyone to do that, nor uh Well, jaywalk. it doesn't have to be a pan. It could, like I said, a box or a cup. They don't call it a it, box handle. He's out there box can, handling. They don't say that. A cup handling. Just, just even just pull your pants out and let them drop the change right in the crotch of your pants there. Just pull it out at the waist and you'll be like a, a human fucking coin depository there. Yeah, you're going to be a human coin depository when they take you down to the tombs. You're going to get arrested for that shit. What are you talking well, about? Well, it, it, I didn't say pull them down. You pull them out. If the if the guy giving you the change looks down, that's up to him. You didn't ask for that. But nevertheless, they will give you money on a street corner enough in, in a, a shorter period of time that you can sign up for this at Shopify.com slash JCE, $1 a month trial period to grow your business no matter what stage you're in or what state you're in, as a matter of fact. Hopefully not in a state of inebriation. Shopify.com slash JCE. That's right. Well, we've gone through the uh, the business well, you're side of things. Well, you take over my program now. Oh, that's ain't right. You? It is your show. Well, we can yeah. uh, turn it back to you. Well, Brian, I'll tell you what they couldn't sell the other night in Savannah, Georgia. What's that, Jim? Well, see, I was waiting for you. you got to be snappy. Here. You <laughs> well, I, didn't, I didn't expect that. You took you me got, by it's surprise. It's the Abbott and Costello thing. It's a give and take. I'll tell you what they couldn't sell in Savannah, Georgia last week. AEW Dynamite tickets. Now, was this the... They were in danger of having the lowest attendance ever, but then I think they had a late flurry of a few hundred tickets, and it's only the second worst ever. Is this what I'm hearing reported? That sounds about right. I don't have anything in front of me. It was a few days ago, but Russell Tix was talking about it, and people were talking about it going into it, just the ticket sales versus even tickets distributed, and then even that versus <laughs> capacity. Versus tickets tickets handed out at homeless shelters around town. And to be fair, Savannah was always a hard town. It didn't draw for the Georgia territory. It didn't really draw for Crockett. It's a, t it's a tough town. But um, it, it, it we're, and we're covering this, by the way, the AEW Dynamite from January 24th. It's almost a week ago as we're talking about it. But to be completionists, and just because we have to, we have to make some notes. We're not going to go through this in granular detail. But there were a lot of things wrong, and we're going to tell them how to modify their behavior. 
It was a rough week. There's a lot of really bad stories out there. We need something to have fun with. And that's what Dynamite's here for. AEW is to have fun with. There you go. Fun. That's what the AEW fans like is fun, right? They say Cornette never likes fun. Well, they, they, here's some fun. So Samoa Joe comes to the ring to do a promo. And not only are they chanting Joe, Joe, what there is of him there, but they're big cheers when he speaks. And again, this is not the fault of the heels. It's the fault of the booking and the bland, blase, shitty, douchebaggy baby faces. And so Joe and, and Swerve, as we know, they're just as popular as can be. And as soon as Joe swears that anybody that faces him is going to be dealt with like Hook was last week, they play Hook music. And out he comes and he speaks in an awkwardly, he looked like he was holding a microphone like, remember I said when I had that fucking staph infection, that big lump under my armpit? on the angle with Wrestling 2 and Magnum TA. He had the microphone up way up over his elbow, was up in the sky. And he said, last week, you won, I lost. And then they shake hands and hook. Me hook, <laughs> you Joe. Uh, well, yeah, it, and it, it was like Cheetah trying to pull Tarzan into a hug because when Hook tried to pull him in, really, Joe's gravitational pull pulled Hook in. And he says, Hook says to Joe, I don't know when or where, but I will see you again. And from the crowd, there was a cacophony of e nothing, no reaction. And Joe said, I bet you will. Now, security, get this unworthy bum out of my ring. And Joe actually gets out of the ring for Hook. And they they have three obvious indie wrestlers come in and take Hook's suplexes and then so he can leave and Joe just goes to the desk and sits down for color it, this was somebody's idea I forgot about the ending of, there yeah. yes it was somebody's idea well we gotta do something for Hook cause he lost what the fuck it's the world champion in the goddamn ring and he doesn't need to be given a warning by again an upcoming young preliminary fellow and then step out of the ring while the guy, obviously there are tomato cans being thrown at him so he can give these people these moves. It was so phony. It didn't do anybody any good. <sighs> it was surprisingly amateur and bad considering Joe was involved. But again, what can you do when, I mean, what was the purpose of it? If anyone comes out here, I'm going to deal with them like I did Hooky. Well, here's Hook. All right, young man, you're a <laughs> decent young man. I'll see you again, I'm sure. Now get him out of here. Like, and then that's the end of Hook. It was and, such and, a and puzzling... to, be, to be fair, Joe, if this was what they all had to do, Joe was as good at whatever he did as you could be. But, uh, yeah, it, 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 they, they, they're afraid to damage any of the talent's feelings, apparently. So they want to give them a... There was a run on concessions. All 12 people went during this segment. <laughs> but then the uh, the first match began. We're seven minutes into the program, and it's Hangnail Page against Penthouse. And I have just a few observations, and we're going to talk about this finish, which was insane. At times, it was so quiet in the arena, not only during this match, but even later on, even worse, that you could hear the ropes quiver. <laughs> <laughs> and if they, when they hit the ropes, you'd hear, <laughs> and both guys, they do the same shit that they always do. And it wasn't that good. The first thousand times that we saw it and they do some more of it and page is boring and penthouse is sloppy. So, and they hit each other hard over and over again while not selling it. And then 15 minutes into the show, they went to a break. So we're, this would not end. So then they did everything they ever did in the match before, but they did it on the apron. And then the finish was Paige gives Penthouse the dead eye where he drops the guy head first over his back. Right, Brian? The dead eye. Right. He gives him the dead eye on the apron of the ring. 
And Penthouse rolled off the apron and st- didn't even go down, stood up on his feet, rolling off the apron so that he could stand there and Paige could hit the blind moonsault off the top rope backwards on top of him, where he caught him, right? And then Paige rolls the guy in the ring and goes for the buckshot lariat, and Penthouse ducked it. He's get, taken a finish on the apron on his head and still didn't leave his feet. Then he was hit by a flipping 230-pound man off the top rope, and when he's thrown into the ring, he can duck the fucking finish. And then when he ducked it, Paige clotheslined him again, went back out to the apron, and did another buckshot, and this time he hit it one, two, three. Does that sound like it made any fucking sense? No. I'm glad you concur. It's the same match these guys have always had there. I mean, these guys are going back to the beginning. They've been there since day one. (laughs) The only difference now is a thicker mustache. Uh. And the crowd was dead. I mean, sometimes you'd hear them react to the theme music and you'd be like, okay, they're alive. They're there. And then they were gone. And with AEW, you never know if it's just a general audio issue because of production or if it's just a dead crowd and it was a small crowd. I thought it might actually be carbon monoxide. (laughs) Well, it was a small crowd and they didn't react to a lot of this stuff. Well, anyway, 23 minutes into the show, that was over with. They brought Officer Barb Brady back, uh, who was in the back stopping Nicholas and Matthew in the hallway, the buckaroos, their Christian names. They're still dressing like, you know, uh, fucking, what, I don't, what are they dressing like? Who dresses like that? Was Don Johnson and the other guy in Miami Vice, was that the... Uh, I don't model know. for this. Is that what they think executives are supposed to dress like? Like arrogant executives I, that they're trying to pretend that they they pretend that they aren't so they can pretend they're a different version of whatever this is? Well, they're they're dressed like uterine cleansing devices. And he asked them, he says, last week your statement or whatever created a ton of buzz. I thought it was more like crickets, but apparently they call it buzz these days. So what is your first plan of action as executives in AEW? That is the question that their own representative, who's been there since the start, asked the EVPs that have been there since the start. What is your first plan of action as executives? Those that they've been there, they've been EVPs. And And referred to it on TV as such. Yes. And how is it supposed to help AEW to have fans think that these douche nozzles are running things? And no normal person that just would watch this TV show would understand what the fuck's going on. And they basically, their blistering promo is that backstage morale is through the roof since they've been back and they blister top flight for being late when top flight had already been there and they just showed up and that was it. They're getting paid seven figures a year to show up and do this. So bad of all the ways to bring these guys back and try to rehab oh. them they went with <laughs> another bad comedy run. Terrible. They went, they went into cocaine rehab by switching to fucking fentanyl. And then Trent with Muffin Top and Pockets had a match with Wardlow, who was with Taven and Bennett and Roddy and Cole, and I invoked the Pudding Gang rule. But when that was over with, Brian, have, have we used the term or do most people know what a cover pitch is? Or should I explain it? Explain it. Well, I, I, it, the cover pitch, and JR used to love to write these in the format because he hated constant on cameras with the announcers, he'd rather, you know, have more excitement and pageantry for a 15-second deal. So he would format, but a cover pitch is when they go to a beauty shot of the arena or the fans screaming or people holding up signs or whatever the case, and the announcers over that will say, and last week you'll remember that it was a fateful night when the house exploded and little Jimmy was trapped in the well. 
and that's a cover pit. And then you pitch to whatever that is, and boom. <clears throat> they did a 55 second. Is there supposed to be like 15 seconds, 20 seconds, right? Because it these shots get old visually quick. They did a 55 second cover pitch with a shot of the ceiling of the arena and the lighting grid <laughs> because they had no beauty shots of the building. It was so sparsely populated and the crowd was sitting there cruising on Lake Havasoma. And so they, but they had, because Tony can't understand that less is more on these billboards. They scream all the matches you're going to see on all these fucking shows that nobody cares about. And Yuji Nagata is going to wrestle somebody Friday night. And then the, the, this and that and the other thing. And it just endless graphics with a cover pitch of the fucking ceiling for almost one minute. And then they went to a, a package with Edge and Minoru Suzuki, who was this particular episode's TV main event, trying to make anybody care about that, and oh boy, howdy. And then they went back to the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> they had to go back to the ceiling to go to a promo with Deanna Perrazzo on the stage. <laughs> so they shot more of this building than they did the fucking ring. The problem is the fans that were there and there weren't many were all shoved together and you couldn't even film them because they were all bored. So the fans that were there all like had their hands on their knee and on their chin just sitting there like, what's next? You couldn't film that. They had the, the next best shot was the ceiling. <laughs> yes, the ceiling. <sighs> I remember one time on a Smoky Mountain Wrestling TV taping when we literally only had like 216 people there and we shot a turnbuckle for the bumpers and the cover pitches. That works <laughs> better than the ceiling. Well, yes, <laughs> but no one but said, anyway. no one said, Hey guys, why are we still on the shot of the ceiling? It, it cause it was so beautiful. <laughs> they were probably like, where else you want me to go? You pick it, find something. I'll take it. I can hear that chatter in the truck. So anyway, speaking of going somewhere else, we could take that shot. The next, they did a sit-down interview on the stage with Renee Moxley Good in between Deanna Perrazzo and Tony Storm with her cohorts, Luther and Mariah May. And the split screen was the the... Deanna's side was in color and the Tony Storm side was in black and white. And they're literally on the same stage. They've taken it so far, it's ridiculous. And the upshot of this thing was talking about their background where apparently Tony Storm was normal and not a mental incompetent. And they used to live together and train together and they showed matching amateur looking tattoos on their ankles it may have been a prison fucking tattoo situation and tony storm told diana to blow the tattoo out of your butthole whereupon diana perrazzo threw her shoe at tony storm and then got a fujiwara armbar on her on the stage while mariah may saves the day and Deanna kicks Luther in the face and the heels run off and Jesus, Mary and Joseph, what the fuck? Explain this one to me, Lucy. I can't explain it. The black and white split screen thing was so stupid. That's when you're taking, oh, you said it was too far the other day when they were just going back and forth and they would switch from one camera to the <laughs> other. This was completely ridiculous and it's not good. Even when Goldust finished his entrance and was wrestling, his side of the ring wasn't and still in black and white, right? And just the ridiculousness what? of Tony Storm again. If she was on a game show or Entertainment Tonight as some wacky person interviewing people on the red carpet, that'd be. So I probably still wouldn't watch, but that'd be <laughs> something. But I, for me, it's lost its charm in the wrestling show because. At a time where people were trying to justify, the AEW women's fans are trying to justify the use of women and more of them on the show. The only one that's over at all is the one doing 
wacky comedy based off 1930s and 40s Hollywood. I don't know what to think of this. It's not for me. I didn't like it. I I was thinking during this, this is going to hemorrhage viewers, but we'll talk about ratings what, later. Wasn't Sunset Boulevard 1951? You may be right. So it's it's more modern than you're giving them credit. What when did Sunset Sunset Boulevard's about earlier years though, in a sense. Well, no, Sunset Boulevard is at the current time, but of about That's the right. woman who has lived through her glory years. This is Tony Storm in the years before she ends up in the house. Well, Hopefully they don't have Eric von Stroheim come in as a technical consultant because read up on him, kids. Um, that would be wonderful. Anyway, so can somebody do a CAT scan on John Moxley? Did you see the promo that, or hear the promo that he did in the back where he was raving as you, but it made it. He makes no sense with anything he says. Uh, I mean, you know, the words go together as he's saying them, but the, the end of the sentence bears no resemblance to the subject that started it. If that uh, kind of describes things. But after that, there was 30 more seconds of the ceiling. And then they went back to an interview with Johnny TV, John, how many names? It? Poor old John Hennigan, Johnny Nitro, Johnny everybody. And Taya Valkyrie, and they look great, and she can talk. She did most of this, and he can work. Why don't we at least see some of them? It it couldn't be any worse. Did you see that clip of them going around? There was something that happened on one of the shows. It must have been Ring of Honor because Dalton Castle was involved. And he was, like, yelling at Jerry Lynn. Maybe it was Collision. I don't even know. And Johnny Nitro comes out of his office, his, office, his locker room, and he says, I got a split. And he does a split, but I guess they tied like a rope around his foot. So as he does the split, someone from behind the curtain pulls it. So he's in a split form, just flying backwards. <laughs> I don't even know how else to explain it. It was the most ridiculous thing. I watched it like 15 times in a row just to see who's pulling that rope. He's just flying back. And then Taya comes through the curtain, but I don't think she was doing it. <laughs> you have to see oh, this. All righty then. So... <laughs> We're here at the all-important 9 o'clock hour, ladies and gentlemen, and we get Swerve Strickland, the most popular heel in the business today, with Prince Nana against Jeff Hardy with Matt Hardy. And boy, howdy. In the Carolinas. Oh, no, Georgia. Excuse no, me. it was Jeff's. And, and Savannah's really... Savannah was an odd duck town. It wasn't really a Georgia town, as I said yeah. earlier, or a Crockett town. It just it sat there. They both ran it at different points. But nevertheless, this match needed to be run out of town instead of run in any town. Um, it was sad to watch on everybody's part because Jeff is obviously not as young as he used to be or capable of doing the things or with the intensity or the speed or the precision. He can't do swerve shit. He can hardly do his own shit anymore. And Swerve is trying to figure out how to get over, you know, or at least turn in a good performance without doing a lot of his shit. And there was just, there was no, there was no life to it. The timing, the staggering, the missing, the, you know, they were underwater. And then, and finally, again, Jeff gives Swerve the twist of fate on the metal stairs and then rolls him in the ring and goes for a swanton and swerve moves already after he's been given the goddamn Hardy's finish on a fucking set of metal stairs. And then Jeff misses the swanton and swerve kicks him in the head and gets a two count. So swerve again, he took the finish on the stairs. Now he moves. Now he's up and running and kicking the fucking guy in the head in 15 seconds. And then Jeff gets some roll-ups, but Swerve hits some more. And a vertical suplex and a double stomp and one, two, three. But this thing had to be almost 15 minutes bell to bell. And it was it just, the, the, I don't know if there's no life in the crowd because there's no life in this match or vice versa, or whether it just, God damn. It, it, did you see what I'm talking about? Yeah, no, I watched this. It wasn't very good. Uh, the crowd certainly, at a certain point, just gave up. 
It was the wrong opponent for Swerve. They're trying to turn Jeff Hardy, or at least Jeff Hardy's trying to turn Jeff Hardy. I don't know. <laughs> which is really the only thing left to do at this point. I don't think you can do that. But no, Jeff Hardy, you know, the other problem is, and again, we'll talk about the ratings later, to put Jeff Hardy in this match at the 9 o'clock hour, you have to think there's some value still in Jeff Hardy. I don't know if there is right now. Well, and if, if there is... What is it value is, to be in the 9 o'clock hour against one well, of the yeah, top guys in the company? No, we're not saying he's completely valueless and should be banished to the land of misfit toys. We're saying ratings draw the Hardy magic of old, etc. But you can't turn Jeff heel because he can't talk well enough to piss people off and people will remember what he's done in the past that a lot of people saw rather than what he's doing now that not a lot of people are seeing. And they will also feel sorry for him because he's obviously physically, you know, not, not a, a spring chicken anymore. So I don't, I don't know. Not good. Wasn't good. Very, very not bad. Not good. Bad. Whatever the fuck. Moving along, next week, as a result of an argument between Hangnail and Swerve, <laughs> they will choose each other's match, the pick your poison thing or whatever the case may be, so that we got that to look forward to for next week. And Thunder Rosa was back to wrestle Red Velvet. Oh boy, did has, you watch this match? Please say you watched this match. Well, I was captivated by Red Velvet, who has tights with a matching cooking apron. So I had to watch some of it. I swear to God, I heard two guys in the front row plotting on how to cheat on one of them's wife. It was a whispered conversation, but the microphones were picking it up because you were in a sound vacuum. It was so the, quiet. It was awkwardly quiet. It was like they were in a cave. The referee's instructions had an echo. And anyway, Thunder Rosa won the match, but when they panned the guests in the front row, and Brian, the, the, the past week's news aside as relates to the WWE, can you see a point in time where the WWE would be there for Raw or SmackDown and they would pan the fans in the front row and then introduce the barnstorming baseball team the savannah bananas well anything could happen in wwe well it it happened in aew that's the biggest celebrities they could get why do it at that point why introduce celebrities if the only ones you can get are the savannah bananas that women's match was pretty rough beyond the crowd uh being silent they didn't work well together at least i didn't think they did well, and yeah, you got a lot of a lot of things working against them. So then, Darby and Sting, Tony Schiavone's in the ring, brings him to the ring. He's good, and immediately Darby takes the microphone from Tony, and he's completely useless and never referred to again. And Darby does the whole promo, and I'm not sure I understood a lot of it. He's like he's doing an essay question. What's it like to team with Sting and his impact on my career? Well, in 2015, when I heard he had to retire, I thought, what if it was me? What if my life's work was cut short? In 2015, Sting had been wrestling for 30 years. I'm not sure how short that's getting cut, right? He was in the prime of his life. And they insert a shot of this interview of the buckaroos back in their, you know, suits watching on the monitor. But Darby rambled. He said, the rankings are back and we're undefeated. So not, why not win the tag team championship before you retire? Because you still got it. And actually, the only thing the fans really reacted to here was they would chant, you still got it for Sting. But then Sting just said, yeah. I'm all in. That's the only, he said, yes, we should. I'll end my career as AEW tag team champion. I'm all in. And they left. It's really uh, weird, wasn't it? And then. He, Cause even like, I'm all in. He's all in the one. Of course they're going to have a match. What are they talking about? Well, that's the thing. It's it, and again, they put the belts on Starks and big bill and wherever that fucking thing is gone. Suddenly they've decided 
that Darby and Sting should be the tag team champions going into Sting's retirement match against the Buckaroos. But the Buckaroos can't win because that would be the ultimate level of douchebaggery for them to win the belts that they don't deserve in the Legends' last match, even if Sting's, oh, I want to put them over on the way out. Fuck you. You're an icon. We're not going to shit on the people like that. Right? Too soon? We're not going to make the people unhappy like that. And so I don't know what the fuck they're thinking here. And then they go to the back, and Starks and Big Bill accept their challenge. And Big Bill's promo was better than Ricky Starks's. I think Starks has just checked out until he can take up residence in Cody's spare room. And they're actually one of the few things in AEW that works is Starks and Big Bill. Yeah, Despite at first the booking, it was a thrown together thing and it kind of got it over. So if they drop the belt to Darby and Sting, which you would think would be the conclusion, because why else do this unless it's to set up them being embarrassed going into the match with the Young Bucks. But if they're going to win the tag titles, that means your two options are the titles become vacant because Sting and Darby retire as, well, Sting retires as tag team champion during that match. Or the Bucks beat Sting and Darby in Sting's final match. Which I don't, man, I don't know how I AEW fans will react I, to you that. You know what? I guarantee you that somebody, maybe the Bucks, has sold Tony Khan. Oh, can you imagine how much heat we'll have if we beat Sting and ruin his retirement match ceremony, whatever the fuck, and win the Bells for the Yeah, they'll have all the wrong kind of heat. And it'll be like, you know, I don't want to watch this shit anymore kind of heat. If they take the piss out of that big moment. That's so, that's the only thing that has sold tickets for anything that they're doing in, until Wembley in fucking August or whenever. And it sold all those tickets before the Bucks were attached to the main event. Yes, a very Hogan-esque, uh, reminiscent of the Georgia Dome. So, <sighs> the world six-man tag team championship was on the line with uh, the reject, Nana's Rejects, the the guys he's got that aren't over, Brian Cage, Tia Leone, and Bishop Khan. And they wrestled the acclaimed and Billy Gunn, who were accompanied by the Gang Bang Gang, because we now have the, the super group called the Bang Bang Scissor Gang. Jay White and the Guns have joined. So you got three baby faces and three heels, and... Caster rapped for the first time in months that I've heard. Uh, they cooled them off quick. And I didn't pay attention to any of this because it was all these fucking idiots on the other side I don't care about. What happened? The rap was good. It was the best rap in a while. Sounded good. He sounded good out there. I didn't watch the match. Okay. Now we come to our main event of the evening. Edge versus Minoru Suzuki. By absolutely unpopular demand of no one, who who was this a rib on? Are they ribbing Edge? Are they ribbing the viewers? It was a gift Where, for Edge. He gets to work with this guy one time before he retires. What the fuck? Why would he want to have a bad match before he retires? This he looks ridiculous. This I know he's a mixed martial arts legend, but the average people watching TBS on a Wednesday night couldn't give a shit and are looking at a. An old, sloppy-looking, pale Japanese guy with toothpick legs doing fake-looking shit. Slowly, at times. Yes. And you'll it, they rang the bell at 7 minutes till 10, so I knew I wasn't going to see the finish. But nevertheless, I'll tell you what I did see. You're never going to guess, ladies and gentlemen, how they started this thing, trading forearms that nobody sold. I thought, who would this match help? Because Suzuki drops in every so often to have fake-looking bad matches where they do the same thing every time. And he's obviously not going to beat Edge here. Edge does not need this win. You mean to tell me it makes Edge more valuable to AEW to beat this fucking guy on TV? And then who's the baby face? Because Suzuki just does the same shit and people cheer for him for whatever reason that the AEW fans cheer for any of these 
decrepit subpar performers. And Suzuki won the forearm exchange twice, dropped edge before he even Suzuki even went to a knee. And I'm right, who I'm right, who's the star? Who are they pushing here? And then they would Suzuki gets a front face lock on Edge, and Edge pushes him through the barricade on the floor, and they lay there, and the arena is deathly quiet, and you the handheld camera pans up, and there's empty seats in the front row. And then once they roll in and beat the nine count that took about a minute, minute and a half, they get in the middle of the ring again and trade 21 fake forearms and real face slaps. Now, here's the thing. You can hit somebody fairly stiff with a goddamn forearm and not hurt them, but a slap is a fucking slap. So they're faking the forearms and they're really slapping each other in the face. And then they did a double knockout on simultaneous face slaps. And we were four minutes into this thing, and I couldn't wait for it to be over with. And they were down again for about another minute, and they got up, and they started trading forearms. And finally, Edge hit his implant DDT, which, again, a combination of Suzuki being almost immobile and everybody treating him like he's a Fabergé egg, it looked like shit. And that was the point where my DVR froze because it was the top of the hour and the show was supposed to be over with. How much longer did this bullshit go on? The bullshit went on for another five minutes. Oh. Hopefully Edge won. Edge won. Edge finally won. Well, that was that. Dynamite. Did anybody watch this thing? Well, let's, uh, well, I'm dropping stuff all over the place here. Let's talk about the ratings this week, Jim. Talk about dropping. Well, let's, <laughs> talking about dropping, let's talk about the AEW Dynamite ratings for this past week, January 24th, 8 to 10.05 p.m. AEW Dynamite was watched on average by 837,000 viewers. The same people, the same numbers. It's, but, uh, uh, the only question is, how high do they start and how low do they go? Limbo, limbo. Well, quarter one, 8 to 8.15 p.m. These were compiled by WrestleNomics. Samoa Joe's live confrontation with Hook, leading to him going to commentary for Penta El Zero Miedo versus Adam Page. One million, 7,000 viewers. That was almost identical to last week, wasn't it? Well, you know, the Big Bang Theory has a good run of shows going right now. Yeah, That's the I Big mean, Bang. I mean, Listen, it's every week now because I've been paying attention to it. The first minute of Dynamite, technically 8 to 801, is the Big Bang oh, yeah. Theory ending. Yeah. So anyone who's yeah. watching that show is staying, and that's boosting that number to, for, for that first quarter every week. Quarter two. 8.15 to 8.30 p.m., the continuation of Hangman versus Penta with Picture in Picture, Orange Cassidy backstage promo, and an ad break, 907,000 viewers. So uh, right off the bat, there goes 100,000. That's not as bad a drop as normal. Well, quarter three, Jim, 8.30 to 8.45 p.m. The Young Bucks backstage promo, Tremperetta versus Wardlow with Picture in Picture, the post-match with Orange Cassidy, <laughs> Chuck Taylor, and the Undisputed Kingdom, Followed by an Adam Copeland video, 903,000 viewers. That's a gift, that they only lost 4,000 on that. I mean, they, the fans said, we want a who's who of wrestling, and they gave them a who's that. Well, the who's that continues into quarter four, 8.45 to 9 p.m. The Deanna Perrazzo tony Storm ramp promo slash angle, an ad break, the Johnny TV Taya Valkyrie backstage promo, and that's it. 841,000 viewers. Ouch. Another 62,000. So now we are 266,000 down from our starting point, halfway through the show. That's not a good sign. 
Well, we're at the big 9 o'clock hour, 9 to 9, 15 p.m., quarter 5. Jeff Hardy versus Swerve Strickland with picture-in-picture picture and an ad break. 793,000 viewers. Oh, the, the Hardy effect worked in reverse. That's 48,000 more people. That's... Uh, 48,000 more people? 48,000 more viewers left from... Oh, to quarter five than quarter four. You mean less viewers? Well, 48,000 more departed. They left. They bailed. <laughs> they got the fuck out of Dodge, is what I'm saying. Yes. There, there were 48,000 more survivors that escaped. All right. Well, let's see uh, who else escapes. We'll go to quarter six, <laughs> nine, 15. Who, who else gets to the top of the bottom of the Poseidon adventure? Before traffic gets bad in Savannah, 9, 15 to 9, 30 p.m., <laughs> Quarter six. Six. The Adam Page Swerve Strickland backstage angle and Thunder Rosa versus Red Velvet with picture in picture. 754,000 viewers. Ouch. And that was all in that 15 minutes. No wonder. There goes another 39,000. Uh, 39, yes, 39,000. We go to quarter seven, 9.30 to 9.45 p.m. The Darby Allen and Sting live promo, an ad break, Billy Gunn and the Acclaim versus the Mogul Embassy with picture in picture, 729,000 viewers. All right, now we are at the low point of the show and 278,000 down from the start of the program. And finally, quarter eight, and we have an overrun too. Oh, boy. Quarter 8, 9.45 to 10 p.m., the continuation of the previous six-man tag match. Adam Copeland versus Minoru Suzuki. 737,000 viewers. <sighs> Five-minute overrun, the continuation of the match. No commercials, by the way. And then an Adam Copeland live promo. 705,000 viewers. Uh, oh, my God. So they got 8,000 people in the last quarter for the main event of the show and with Edge, and then the last... it The overrun always does better than quarter eight because you get all the people that were already watching plus the people who were tuning in for the next program. This is the first time I can ever remember. They lost 32,000 people in the overrun? A lot of it's the trend of the show and what was interesting people and what wasn't. A lot of it, I think, unfortunately, a lot of the overruns we see are with people that are featured regularly on this TV show. Edge versus Minoru Suzuki may not be what holds a audience, even the key demo. Well, I mean, if you looked at the first seven minutes of it, you sure didn't want to see any more of it. But I figured for most people that were already there by that point, they'd stick it out. But, oh, so they actually were down 300 and 2,000 viewers from the start of the program, and 302,000, that means basically they lost 30%. They started with a million, and they ended up with 700,000, let's say, so they lost 30% of the audience from the start to finish. Well, that was Ooh. Dynamite, This that was Tony's show, and this is your show. And it's my show, and it's over! And you are out of here. Don't ever come back here again. Don't show your face. Do not darken my doorstep until next week on The Experience or in just a few days on Brian's show, The drive Through. And I think we've given up the breaking news updates. But otherwise than that, folks, thank you. Fuck you and bye-bye, everybody.